Well, there it goes. The neighborhood. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to the show, the show that we do every week and have been doing. Every, is that me or you? No, I think that's you. That we have been doing live every week, just about here and there, with some time off since October of 2002. And look at this. This is our 804th episode of Dave's Gone By with me, Dave Leftowitz, my darling, wonderful, and adorable wife, Joyce. How you doing, Joyce? I'm trying to find you an information for your play. I'm going to say, hey, have you heard Dave's got a play? Have you ever? Well, <clears throat> we will be talking about... Everybody run. David's got a gun and a play. Everybody <laughs> yeah, run. That's right. David's got a play. Well, what's kind of, kind of fun today and kind of neat is that, I mean... Yeah, it's kind of, it's sort of like back in the day when Howard Stern would have a pay-per-view special, and for weeks on end on his radio show, all he would sort of talk about and lead up to was all the stuff leading up to the special, because he was trying to promote it and, and get paid and, and such. So you can't really blame me over the past couple of weeks for constantly dovetailing the conversation uh, back to the fact that I'm going to have a one-act play being done by an off-Broadway theater company called the Red Bull Theater, uh, and it, it's happening pretty soon. It's July 12th. It's a virtual thing. It's one night, Monday night, 7.30 in the evening. It's a one-act play, part of a benefit uh, of, of eight one-acts by different writers. There are two writers who were commissioned and six writers, you know, like me, who just kind of saw the contest, decided to write a play, send it in, and out of the hundreds, presumably... You have an awarded play? What, sorry? You have an awarded play. Well, you know, on the, well, yeah, it's, it is. It won the award it, by being selected in this festival. I guess that's kind of an award. It is. It is. I, I was a finalist, and now I am a winner. I guess that's an award. Yeah. So, um, so. Oh no! Oh, choices. Mailchimp isn't work. Have you tried the mail orangutan? No. Because that works. That works better usually. And on Monday the. 12th of July at 7.30 in the evening. You can go right on Red Bull Theater's website. And by the way, you can either pay nothing, you know, be a cheapskate like me, or um, you can make a donation. I think donations start at $25. I'm trying to get them to have donations that pay what you can level. It's supposed to be pay what you can, all the way up to being a benefactor and a donor and things like that. But the main thing is whether you can pay a little, a lot, or nothing, you can tune in Monday night, July 12th, 7.30. See my play along with plays by several other writers. As I said, two of them were commissioned, so they were kind of automatic winners. It's like, write a play for us and we'll do it, which is a wonderful permission, to, uh, a position to be in. And then these six other people, myself included, who were like, okay, we'll just send in a play and, and keep our fingers crossed. And among those other playwrights, who are also going to be having a play done the night that mine is, is a veteran writer and dramatist. Her name is Connie Congdon. See, I'm, I, I, it's a little hard for me to pronounce because it's going to sound like condom, but it's C-O-N-G-D-O-M, Connie Congdon, probably best known for her play Tales of the Lost for Mikans, which I believe was done off-Broadway, but she's been writing for years. She's also been teaching playwriting at Amherst, for about three decades. She recently retired. And one of the great things is, especially as shown in our plays this year, for this festival, the Short New Play Festival, is she just has this great love and facility with language. And she will write plays, entire full-length plays, as I have, in rhymed verse and in meter and in a Shakespearean style or a Restoration style or a Jacobean style. I mean, she will get into that. I think she's also done adaptations of people like Moliere and, I don't know, Witcherly and folks like that. So it's going to be fun. Apparently she has an amazing sense of humor. Well, if you read her plays, you know she has a... a and I'm very yeah. sad because in the photo, her head, is, her head is between all those books. She might get crushed. She's not going to get crushed That's by the books. That photo she was taken... She was afraid. Look. Oh, you think? That could be very no, dangerous. she's very happy. The, the picture yeah, that we posted on Facebook. Very dangerous. Look, one, one false move of the book and... 
Well, yeah, but maybe her head is behind where the books are, so she can just pull her head out real fast. And because, unlike those people in Florida. <laughs> so um, Joyce is referring to the picture that we have on our Facebook page, where you see it's a great picture. Her face just there are books over, books under, and books to the side. Which, if you're someone who loves literature, as she obviously does, and loves theater, uh, you know, this is the most appropriate photo ever. So. Connie Condon will be our guest. That's why we're calling this episode Pros and Cons, because Constance Congdon Con. And I was thinking of either doing it prose, like writing prose, but since actually she sometimes does poetic stuff, I'm guessing that the play that she submitted and was accepted for the festival, which is called... No, that's not the name. That's just me humming. It's Y U M P A D U M. No, uh. Wait, hold, hold on. Well, let me just give her the name of her play. If this be not a good play, then the devil is in it. That is the name of her one act play that will be done. Then the same night mine is. If this not be a good play, then the devil is in it. So she's definitely going like. That's, that sounds more Jacobean than Restoration, but there you go. What's the show where they all wore leather and they behead people? Um, was that Grease? No. It was Very a, bad production you know, of Grease. show we saw? It was a theater where they, the woman comes in wearing robes and takes a candle and brings you in the theater. And well, that would have been La Mama. It was a Jacobian, a Jacobian yeah, yeah, yeah. thing, and then they all wore leather. And it was like, um, it was like a, a warring woman. It was beautiful. W were they adapting the Greeks? I thought it, they I could have been so. in a modern... I, it was a, I can't remember the play. Oh, so good. Was it Last of the Red Hot Lovers? No. Uh, I, think I think it was Nerf Hong Kong. <laughs> uh, speaking of plugging my other work. So so there you go. So it's going to be a lot of fun to have Connie Congdon in the neighborhood with us on this Saturday morning. It is, by the way, June 26, 2021. Last Saturday in June. What's also great is that Connie... Uh, assuming I don't offend her too horribly with my questions, will stay on and play the today yesterday trivia. I'm a, I'm a little worried yeah. because Dave Schuert, who is like he's like the reigning champion. He's like yes. the Ken Jennings of your quiz show. Yeah, but, but I'm, I'm worried because I don't know if he lets people win. But last time Vicky won. I mean, she's a fierce yeah. competitor and she has ex excellent virtual background. So I think that distracts people. They're like, what does the virtual background mean? And now. You know, one time Leslie won. I don't know. Yeah, yeah no. Do you uh, think it could be a changing of the guards? Oh, my God. Well, even at some point after 70 games, Ken Jennings lost. You know, it, it happens. So last week, David Sheward, a theater critic and blogger, was dethroned as champion of the Today Yesterday trivia quiz. Because it's not just about theater. It's about history. It's about culture. It's about whatever happened in the world on that date. So all the questions of our quiz, uh, trivia quiz coming up later today will be about June 26th. Yeah, aww. Um, Joyce is showing me a picture of a dachshund. So, um, so David Stewart lost last week. <gasps> will he retake the crown? He's, he's got some competition. He's going to be up against... Now, now David Stewart during the week is a teacher. I think he teaches high school. And so Connie Congdon has been teaching in an academic setting for 30 years. So them up against each other and up against Leslie Hoban Blake, theater critic and theater director, it should be a heck of a game. It'll be this. That you know yesterday quiz. What's that? <laughs> Those... Those are the sounds you will hear during the Today Yesterday Trivia Quiz on Dave's Gone By today, June 26th. What else are we going to do on the program? Well, some of the more usual fun stuff. For example, we do, we do have a Colorado limerick of the damned. Since 2018 now, we've been broadcasting these. Uh, uh, so I, I started writing them before I started doing them on the show. But every week I bring out a new and increasingly horrible poem, five-line poem, short, about some place, town, city, municipality, 
in beautiful Colorado. And I to deface it and desecrate it by writing the sickest, nastiest little poems that you can possibly imagine. They're Colorado limericks of the damned. And this week, we go to Montezuma. There is a Montezuma, Colorado, and we're going to have a poem about it later on in the show. And of course, we will also have Greeley Crimes and Old Times. Speaking of Colorado, and speaking of living in northern Colorado, uh, the newspaper there, as everybody who watches this show knows, is the Greeley Tribune. And the Greeley Tribune has two columns that they run every week <laughs> just for fun. One of them, uh, and, and by the way, they're both based on true things. One of them is based on phone calls that come into the local police department from people seeing weird things happening in their neighborhood and wanting to call the cops. But not everything is deserving of the police's attention. So those are collecting its public record. And that's right, you'll find them, the people calling dispatch in the Tribune, and then we, we enjoy the best ones here as well. And we mix them up with another column in the Trib called um, 100 Years Ago. Our friend over there, Mike Peters, goes through the newspapers from 1921, and he looks for the funniest, goofiest, most nostalgic uh, things in retrospect. They may have seemed perfectly normal back in 1921, and now we look back and we go, oh my god, I can't believe that they put that in the newspaper. Well, they did. We mix them up and we call them Grilly Crimes and Old Times. And that, my friends, is what lies ahead for the next, well, three hours of your time here on Dave's Gone By. So, first of all, before we get to, before I start to go off on stuff, how you doing, babe? I'm good. Joyce is good. What's new? She's not a lot. I, I hear myself talking, I'm not sure, is that coming from me? I wonder, I, I purposely potted it down. Wait, let me talk. There we go. Yeah. Now, the stupid thing, I, I pot it down and it doesn't stay down. Why are you taking my smiley face? I can't, it's stuck. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> you don't like my smiley face? Ow. I found that on the street. That was one of my happier things this week. I found this covered with horrible schmutz on the street, and there it is. So, ladies and gentlemen, yeah. Um, what else do I want to tell you about this week? Um, we, we, we ventured. We we it's been, what is it, 15, 16 months into the pandemic at this point. Joyce and I took a big step this week. We didn't go to New York, right? We didn't go out to, to Connecticut for a, you know, a B and B or anything like that. We didn't um, go into a Target or so. No, we went to an open air farmers market. Now we used to enjoy this a lot in in, uh, in our Colorado time when there was a farmers market in Greeley, Colorado. Greeley keeps coming up. Yeah. Right by the train station downtown yeah. by like, what was it, 8th Street or 8th Avenue and all the way sort of towards the east. It was yeah, almost no, the border of yeah, east. What was the train station before they didn't want anyone coming into Greeley? <laughs> exactly. And it was fun. I mean, it was like we, we'd see the same people every year. I thought the produce um, towards the end was going downhill a bit. I, I yeah, look the, forward the all week. The tomato lady was my favorite. Then she left. The who lady? The what lady? Tomato lady. Remember, she had all those tomatoes. Oh, God, it. yeah. And I would get tomatoes from this other guy with a long white beard. Very friendly. And, and, they were you know. related to Linda. I think they were related to our admin. Really? Yeah, I, the, that I didn't I know. I think his wife was somehow related in some way. I don't recall, but yeah. But at, at a certain point, you know, I'd buy, I would go like, ooh, farmer's market tomatoes. And then they wouldn't be any better than the supermarket ones. I'm like, how the hell with that? But, you know, you can still get good squash. And I do like saying squash as squash. I don't know why I enjoy it, but I'm, just say it with me, squash. I do enjoy good squash. And we, uh, just, just, it was a thing to do on Saturday. In fact, we, we, I would finish up my show at the radio station, UNC Radio, and then just zip in the car, run downtown, and say, okay, we need um, cucumbers, we need um, zucchini. If they have decent-looking tomatoes, we'll get that. Sometimes, I don't know what else I would get. Uh, not onion. I would be tempted, but I never actually bought the roasted peppers that the Mexicans would bring. What, what were those? They were green... Jalapenos? 
Well, they weren't that. Um, they weren't spicy like jalapenos. They were. C O N N I E Connie, right? Yeah, Connie uh, Congdon. Uh, they they would roast these greeny pepper things, and they looked so good. But we never knew what we would put them in or eat them with. And, and then there was, and then they had the usual crap like the bath soap and the, the dog treats and all this. So. You know, it's not like I love farmer's markets, but it was fun. It was nice that you go up and down once or twice. You see all the people in the neighborhood. And on a nice day, it was a nice way to be out for 10 or 15 minutes to, to do something and not be in a supermarket looking for your produce there. So finally, you know, Joyce is looking on the computer and she says, oh, my God, not very far away from where we're living um, is an outdoor farmer's market. And they're probably going to have a lot of the same stuff that we're used to, that we look for. So I'm like, fine, let's do it. And it's on a Sunday morning. Let's go. And and we went and, you know, had a little difficulty finding parking. I think it'll be easier tomorrow when we go. And we get there and, and it's not this huge, amazing, it's not like a thrift store or what do you have those outdoor flea market things. It's a small farmer's market, although somehow within like a block and a half radius, they, they managed to find five different people selling like dog cuisine. <laughs> how many people, I know a lot of people, have, but how many people aren't feeding their pets either Alpo or Yukonuba or Royal Canaan and are specifically looking for, oh, specialty homemade dog treat cookies and ice cream. It's like, uh, it's kind of, I mean, at some point, we hope we'll have another dog again, but it's kind of nice, kind of nice not having to deal with all that. <laughs> and not thinking, oh, should we get this or will it give our dog diarrhea? Nah, they, oh, we'll try one. You know, or do we have, do we, should we get a, a nice, cute little artisan bowl for $15? It's like, no, don't need it, not thinking about it, bye. But, you know, I, they also have the handcrafted soap and soap made out of dead bees or whatever they use, locust soap. And and at this time of year, we sort of forgot that you're not gonna, really going to get vegetables yet. Some fruits for sure, but veggie time comes closer to August. I that's when the harvest is. So we're a little disappointed looking for veggies because Joyce is a prolific salad eater. Uh, but got some really really delicious apples, not red delicious apples. What were they? They were what kind of apples were they? They weren't pink lady. Maybe they were pink lady or, or something like that. Um, and they had blueberries, which we didn't get to try. She bought um, special, like locally sourced honey, which, which literally. We, and what's great about it is it's honey that if I were more of a driver, I could get in the car and drive about an hour and ten minutes and go right to the apiary. I mean, I would I would be pooping myself in fear going that close to bees. But it's nice to know that if you're looking for honey. Not just for the flavor, and not just for the, the throat coating medicinal properties, that's what I'm drinking now, in fact, mm. but also for local allergens and to build up immunities to things, you want honey that is sourced as locally as possible. So, so here's honey that's coming from like Riverhead. I wonder if people from New Jersey, though, are like, they, they want honey from anywhere else because the bees. <laughs> Think about it. You know, these bees are breathing the air of New Jersey. They're, they're, they're circling about all these factories and all these nuclear plants or, or what have you. Then they're going on trees that are full of pollution. And so, no, Jersey people probably want honey from Connecticut or, or Montana or something like that. I don't know. I don't know how that all works. But last week she got her honey. She, uh, she loves it. There's another honey that we get in the supermarket that is local. Uh, it's a little less sweet and a little less syrupy. Uh, yeah. Joyce says it's nice to have one of each, and she'll mix them I'm together. I'm trying this, this, this just killing me. Mm. Well, yeah, we're, we're both. We're both. Oh, th which, oh, oh, boy! What a perfect segue you just gave me. Um, <laughs> so Joyce has been tortured with like headaches and and some level of allergy and sinus. She we're assuming from just being in New York during this season with the pollen and the trees and the humid and the because yeah, when you live in Colorado for a while you get used to dry warm weather and not as much foliage or, or varied kind of foliage because all the pine any trees you've got are sucking up whatever water there is 
So she's got that. And for months now, on and off, I've been, <laughs> well, I can confess everything on here. Why not? So, so I've been dealing with um, some sort of skin irritation. It started literally, I thought it was a stress thing. And, and b believe me, if you're thinking of tuning out now and you don't want to hear this and you're just like, oh, believe me, it will be worth the reveal. I promise you. So, <laughs> months ago, I started this new job. I'm good. I'm good. I started this new job at a school district locally. And at the time, it was tremendously stressful. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, and yet I was still expected to do it. <laughs> and, and I just literally, I was trying to do 18 things at once and figure out, literally just how to go from one thing to another and make them all. I, it was just, it was maddening and terrible, and I was doing a terrible job. Uh, so I was stressed out of my mind. You know, it was summer hours, so there sort of was a shorter day, but every minute of that day was fraught. And so, you know, literally like the first week I thought, oh, I can't, I'm just going to quit. I'm going to beg for my old job back, and, and that's that. Um, so, and I noticed within a week or two or three that, like, my elbow was really, really itchy. And it was like, and I, you know, I'd scratch, and then it'd get, you know, which is not... The one thing you're not supposed to do, but I scratch the elbow, scratch, 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 and it would turn sort of white and crusty, and I get like little pimply things on it. I'm like, what the hell is that? And just, and you can't help yourself because if it itches, you want to scratch, and it feels good. Even the hurt feels kind of good when you're scratching. <laughs> and I'm, and now I'm thinking, I, what the hell is this? Is it related to stress? Is well, it? Well, in, you, didn't you fall into a bush? Well, you yeah. Found the yard? Well, there, it could have been. That's the problem. It could have been three different things. Um, connect as my, the other could be like, well, maybe, you know, during the pandemic stuff, whoever was at this desk or the cleaners of this desk put down some weird caustic -y material. And so when I put, you know, if I'm wearing short sleeves, I've got my elbow on the desk and now I picked up something from this building. Maybe I'm in a sick building. Uh, also like the first week I was there, I'm like, okay, I, got, I just got to get out of here for a few minutes to go take a walk during, you know, my lunchtime. So I tried going around the building, and at, at one point, there was a locked gate. And I'm like, oh, no, what the hell am I going to do? So there's, there's room. I mean, it's a, it was a school. It was a kindergarten. Now it's our offices. So <clears throat> I push through. There's this hedge and a tree. And I push through between the hedge and the tree, not knowing. God knows it could have been ivy or oak. Or something. I'm trying to squeeze through, but you know everything's touching everything, and and I don't even think about it. And then suddenly, boom! Now <clears throat> I've got this, and in weeks ahead, this would show up on other parts of my body. So it would be especially like thighs, inner thigh, uh, and also like top of thigh. That was, that was the the real bad one, and it would be really itchy. And you can see actually the skin getting red under like the, the pimply, scratchy, whatever part. And then it was just, and, you know, I'd sit there. I mean, I've been thinking about it. Because if you're wearing pants, as usually I do when I go to work, you know, you're, you're sitting there, you're not thinking, uh, you're not looking at it. You know, over the pants, you're just kind of going scratch, 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 and you're, you're irritating it more. But you need to, or else you're going to go mad from the itch. And the thing was, as my job became a bit less stressful, because A, the people I work with have been just wonderful, um, B, I started to know what the hell I was doing, and C, at least until the like the next. Well, what? It's touching a heart, and then the heart gets. Oh, it's getting all. X-ray. Oh, Joyce just posted. Yeah, um, um, oh, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> so, my my as my job de-stressed, week by week by week by week, until I'm now very happy and comfortable actually in in the job. Which so. Have a nice group, a very oh, nice, wonderful. You always talk about how nice the people are and how good they get along. Mm. I think that's really. Uh, but it's also rare session. that things are batshit there, <laughs> you know, as they were. <laughs> d depending on the week, it can be batshit for other parts of the, of the people I work Whenever with. This semester starts, right? It's like yeah. things are quiet now. As soon as I start the syllabi and start getting in the ow, getting in the um, you know, the well, you have to populate. Yeah. Up, yeah. And, you know, on once campus. you start getting ready for school. 
things ramp up. It's like right. ebb and flow, you know? Yeah. So as it, as it ebbed and ebbed and ebbed, and I thought, okay, I'm going to get better. So it wasn't stress. It was, this was totally not no, stress-related stress at all. And I, it, it, I've been working there, and this, my elbow's gotten fine, so it isn't whatever cleaning yeah, that they're doing. It's my what? Um, I have had, Joyce thought it was shingles, because I've had shingles in my life, but it was different. I had it. didn't follow a nerve track. Yeah. And shingles is painful. Now. It's itchy and very painful. Okay. Um, this was not painful. It was just plain itchy. Um, I, I, what? It could have, I was thinking, or Joyce was thinking, it could have been a recurrence of my syphilis, but <laughs> I knocked that out. I, I did. I got herbal tea and no syphilis no more. I thought, is it eczema? What the hell is it? And then I, I recounted the story a couple of weeks ago when I went to a local dermatology zoo here in town where the doctor's very competent and very fun, very, very nice, but the, the way the place is run, it's really just completely it's clinic. yeah i mean here in the middle of one of the richest neighborhoods in long island well, not, not our part of it but yeah but no i mean we're not okay mid well to do yeah. neighborhoods around here and they're running it like you know some uh, emergency clinic in the middle of the south bronx and i know that's a racist thing to say but it's just it's ridiculous you know and and you're just like who, I think you felt you just weren't given attention. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was, I was given a perfectly good diagnosis. The doctor knew exactly what he was doing. I did say, I did, you know, th there's, there's literally almost grounds for, I wouldn't say a lawsuit or anything like that, but, you know, I went in there for one thing. I went in there, could you please look at this rash and this rash and this over here? And the first thing he did was he came in with a hypodermic needle and cut a skin tag. I'm like, that's not what I'm here for. Welcome to Madison. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm sure that, that gave him like several hundred dollars out of our HM, out of our health plan. And I'm like, that is not why well, I know probably the, the PA noticed it. And you, I guess, noticed it. And you're like, oh, that can go. But if, you, if I walked in here and they said, well, do you want your skin tag? I like it looked at to make sure it's not cancerous. But if it's not, I don't want a shot. I've already had, I've had more vaccinations. Or, or injections this year than I've had in the past, like, since I had my hernia. So it was like 25 years, right? I've had one or two um, injections for, for tooth work. <laughs> All right, I'm, yes, you know I'm needle-phobic. Tooth work? What is tooth work? <laughs> well, yeah, oh, wait, we dental go. stuff. Here we go. Oh, I got that one. I have a wisdom tooth removed. They had to put me under. All right, you know. I got to find the one I'm looking for. But this is like... You know, I had two shots for COVID, and now suddenly this idiot is giving me, like, a, an injection to numb the area where he's going to slip, snip a skin. I'm not here for a skin tag removal. What is wrong with you? I mean, I'm real. I'm still angry about it, even though really? it's healed fine. It was probably the right thing to do. It could at any time have gotten irritated and, and what have you. But I'm like, this is, you just gave me a shot. I'm scared of shots, and I'm not, that's not why I'm here. So I went through this a couple of weeks ago, and they gave me a, a cream that eventually took a very long time, probably helped a bit, but didn't really solve the underlying problem. Uh, you know, so it healed sort of one area and dried it up eventually after we literally used a tube of um, mometazole, I think it was called, uh, which which has what's the thing the active ingredient? It's got. Um, you know, a little, tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of corticosteroid in it. And so, on some, and they gave me an allergy, you know, the, not, I don't even know what they call the scratch test. It's more like a, a claw test. They put these plastic claw things in your back, and they, each of the little claw points has some, you know, forest thing on it. So it's checking which flower and which shrub you might be allergic to, right? And then what was funny, I mean, this will tell you about the, the way this place was run. One of the PAs came in, she looked at my back, and he says, oh, my God, you're allergic to everything. Holy crap. And then she brings in the doctor and said, no, no, no. <laughs> she read it wrong. <laughs> you, you've got, you might have a tiny little, um, little bit more of a predisposition to be allergic to something called privet, like privet hedges. We don't know what the privet, where, you know.
I spend some time in the privy all day, but that's that's my own business. Um, so that was weeks ago. And my overall rash does not really go away, right? even using this cream, etc. And so I'm like, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back, but I'm not going to the same doctor. I'm not going to the same zoo, this place. They're nice people. They are competent, but they're not competent in running the place. And I didn't, you know, I was, I, I, I think I even told the story that I was done. And nobody told me I was done and could just go home. So they're all packing up to leave, and then they see me in the room, like, what are you doing here? I'm like, what are you doing here? You know? Idiots. Right? Um, so I go, and I make an appointment with another local doctor whom I've heard pretty good things about. Him. Apparently, he's, he doesn't have the best bedside manner, but people have been using him for years. He's really good. He knows his stuff. He's fine. And... I make this appointment, and wouldn't you know, and, and my mother would say this. I, I literally hear my mother's voice of this. As soon, well, you know, I had like, I made the appointment, and it was about a week and a half later that I would go. As soon as I made that second appointment with this other doctor, I started getting better. <laughs> For months, I would have outbreaks and all over my body and this and that. And I'd scratch. And I'd have it on my knee, and I'd have it on, like, near my ankle, and then I'd have it back on the thighs. And oddly enough, never on my back, but my stomach a little bit. It was just, like, awful. Uh, manageable, but awful. And then, like, no, my psychologically, knowing that I had another doctor to see, and another doctor who might just come out with a with a hypodermic needle and say, okay, this is the first thing we do. And then, um, and, and day by day, I was like, holy crap, the thing's going away. To the point where I, I was thinking of canceling the appointment. But I'm like, you know what? No, no, no. I'm out of this other cream. So if I, I need more of that, at the very least, I'll get it from this guy. Right? And so I go to the appointment. It's a bit more of a normal doctor's office routine thing. And um, hysterically enough, the, the doctor isn't even there yet. He doesn't get in until five. My appointment was a quarter to five. So of course I first see the PA person. But this PA person is not some you know college student first learning the ropes of, gee, what is skin? It's called dermis. This is a woman who has been doing this stuff for like probably two, three decades. Very nice, very nice. I, you know, I kind of wish she were the doctor. She certainly behaved like the doctor. And I told her my problem. She looked me over. And she said, oh, you know, all right, well, I'm going to give you just a stronger, you know, obviously the momentazone may have worked a little bit, but you're not done yet. Let's give you something a little bit stronger. And then I, I did the big confession that I'll, I'll tell a little bit of here, of all the scratching or whatever unrelated probably and yet still kind of in the same ballpark is and, and, and every man every man over the age of 40 watching this will appreciate this that there are few things in the world better for a middle-aged or older man than to scratch your sack it's a great feeling it's like, you know, it's, it's at a certain age, it gets better than sex. It's better than watching your favorite show. It's just, you stand there, your mind goes blank. You reach down and you just go, ah, you scratch. Yes, you, you find that place. And even after you've taken away the itch, you just keep like, oh, so good. And it's not like masturbation. You're not jacking off or anything like that. You're just like finding the testicular area and going, scratch, scratch, scratch. Uh, and then you find the other spot. Oh, scratch, 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 scratch. But I was doing it <laughs> to the point where I'm like, yeah, this is probably not normal middle-aged man enjoyable scratching. There's some real itch there. There's some maybe kind of going on down there. Let's let's warn this doctor also about the basket, and and see what she has to say. And I I told her you know a certain other element of that. I said, all right, I'm going to give you. Um, one ointment for the rest of you whenever you have an outbreak and you, you see the pimples or you see the, the redness. And I'm going to give you a second ointment just for the naughty bit area. And do not confuse them because very, it is actually kind of important. On the other areas of your skin, you have a bit of a stronger 
uh, cortisone, a, a stronger steroid, when you need it. But you don't want to use the, the heavy, stronger stuff on, you know, the, the boys down there because, I, you know, they're, they're more delicate, I guess, and maybe it permeates more deeply because it's a thinner sheath of skin. I don't know. But, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to show you <laughs> the, um, I just want to make sure I, there's no personal information. So here's the deal. This is the stronger ointment that I get to use on me, and I haven't had to use it yet. This is the beautiful thing. Since the doctor, and that was already last Monday, and, and the week before that, better, better, better. There's no particular real outbreak I can point to. But if I do get one, um, I, I can try some of this. And, and my wife wrote this, like, danger. Danger. Uh, it's not cholesterol. It's clo clobetazole propionate, which has a I guess a 0.5% of a steroid in it is not for ophthalmic. Whoa, why would you put this in your eye? I mean, you do not want to get this anywhere near your eye. Uh, and there it is. Okay. And, and Joyce very kindly put the word danger just to, just to say this is not the thing that's going to go below your waist. I mean, on your knee, fine, on your leg, but not, not in the naughty area. And then this is the beautiful thing. This is absolutely beautiful. On the tag, <laughs> wait, where did, oh, here it is. <laughs> On the, 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 this is hydrocortisone, 2.5%. This is the, the gentler one. Um, is a, okay. Apply, says the doctor, a small amount, <laughs> topically, twice a day to affected area scrotum. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to show that because it's got my name and stuff on it. But Joyce... It's, it's, it's hydrocortisone cream, another one, right, USP 2.5% for, for the boys, for the sack. No, and Joyce... No, my mom said to have the glove wearing. You could say well, tell her, tell you tell. So my mom said, you need to wear gloves because if you put this stuff for your... Um, for my sack. On your eyes, it's going to burn. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, so okay. this is telling me, Joyce wanted to make absolutely sure. So she said... Danger, danger, she wrote on this. Don't use this. Oh, I just probably put my name on there. Uh, danger, danger, don't use this one in the special area. And then one of the most beautiful things she wrote on the tube. Okay. That's dangerous. <laughs> Scrotum only, ladies and gentlemen. Scrotum only. Uh, put your numbers up today. What numbers? <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? There you go. Scrotum only. And I think that's a Swedish band that won the Eurovision Song Contest for three years in a row. <laughs> oh, so this is the Scrotum only edition. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, if during maybe the quiz today or really crimes and old times, you see me kind of, kind of reaching for a tube and going, <laughs> you'll know, <laughs> you will know, it's Scrotum only time. Oh, so that's my story. Uh, lordy, lordy, lordy. Ladies and gentlemen, oh, and the other thing that we got, speaking of things that are not really medical, oh, I'm so glad we found these. How have you been enjoying your toe things? I've not used them enough. Why? They're wonderful. Oh, but I, I, Joyce has minor ones. I've got bad bunions. Um, thank goodness they don't bother me. They're just very, very prominent and I have to wear shoes a size bigger than I my foot actually is. But Joyce has started wearing this these toe called, things. This episode should be called TMI. <laughs> <laughs> TMI, TMI. Now you can push these into your butt, but oh, that's not what they're meant uh -oh, for. What? Uh -oh. What? Stan said Dave the scrotum scratcher. <laughs> <laughs> can you put if if uh, if you outlive me, yes. can you put that like David, David, in quotes, the scrotum scratcher, scratcher Lefkowitz. That would be, that would be, really I just have an image of like two cute little balloons <laughs> with maybe red carving on them. Uh, that would be great. Anywho, it is, what time is it? It's, it's 20 to 10 Eastern time here in the neighborhood <laughs> with me, Dave Lefkowitz. I, I, but, uh, guys, do, do, do you use these? Have you ever seen these? They're soft, 
gel because I don't know how people wear the hard ones, the hard plastic. I just hope that Stan does not make another image of you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> it would have to be a naked image. The I was last wondering. one he made was you as Mr. Rogers. This one takes it a whole other way. Stan, here, here's, it's very simple. All you got to do is take uh, a, the statue of David by Michelangelo, which oh, is naked, right. and then just turn like the, the sack red and put my face where David's face is, and you've got your next image to, to doctor. Well, yeah, it's a lot of work, but worth it. But worth it. Anywho, you want to get uh, criminal, dear? Uh, I have to go in three minutes because I have to set up that room. It's not oh, you're not even so. Desk. I have to clean the, the, the things down. I have to get my weights together. So why don't we save grilly crimes at all times? We'll do a little. I'll do a little more yak yak. yak. Honey, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, have you heard about the Brandeis thing then? No. Brandeis University oh. has come out, and and they talk about this all over, like right wing radio, and to some extent they're right, and to some extent they're wrong, but. Brandeis came out with a recommended list of words that we have to be careful with, or should, or that we should be On that careful I focus where I'm going. Yeah, well, yeah, right. But do you know yeah. what one of the trigger words is? I can't. No, what, get it, one of the trigger words that you should be tell very me, careful tell using. Me, tell me. It's one of the trigger words. Literally, trigger? among the words that you should not be using, because you might trigger people, are, tr are the phrase trigger words. Because trigger might have somebody who underwent some level of gun violence, and they might hear the word it's trigger words and be triggered. It's a whole different world, baby. It, and I know. And, it, but, so, the okay. <laughs> well, thank you for your help. Uh, really appreciate it. But that's my wife, Troy. She'll be back. <laughs> but um, she has her gym appointment, and and you know, and I'm doing this show. So I, I did read about this, and let, let's first of all be very very clear. This is not a list of words that are being banned by Brandeis University. It's nothing like that. They're not saying never, or to the, certainly to their student body, you know, cannot use these words. Um, if you, if these are in your papers or your dissertations or your your theses, and if you've ever smelled their theses, it's not very nice, uh, you, then, then you don't graduate and we'll call you into the office, you might be suspended, expelled. It's, no, it's just like, it's 2021, um, we're all very sensitive, we're all trying to be very empathetic and woke, and therefore, here's a list of words and phrases that you probably, you know, have to have extra caution that you didn't even think about. But again, the, the overboard craziness of this, and especially, I mean, this affects me in a direct way as a person who is a playwright, a person who gets on here and speaks extemporaneously as a podcaster and, and a radio person. And it's like, don't please tell me words that I can and can't use or should and shouldn't use unless they're obviously terrible. Right. Uh, I know as a thinking American you know, person that the N word has to be used in a very particular context. If I'm talking about or quoting from a Richard Pryor album from the 1970s, it's sort of hard to avoid the title of that album. If I'm using it in context of the way black people might talk about each other or in rap lyrics or as a negative word that we shouldn't be using, but that the blacks have tried to reclaim. Da, 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 da. Fine, that's a word I'm, we all not real, real cautious with. But, you know, I, I'm, again, we run into this thing. People of color is the new one now. People, and it's not that new. They've been talking about this for a few years now, that they try to think, well, God, black people have come up and undergone so many different ways to talk about them where you're trying not to be offensive, where you're trying to be completely neutral and generic. And all right, all right, what do you, so obviously the N word, the C word for, for black people, the, you know, this word and that word, yeah, okay, no, 1920s Ku Klux Klan, bad, bad. So what do we call? So all right, African-American, or there was a period Afro-American, but that 
was a little iffy because not yeah, there there are black people here who have been here for six, seven generations. The, the level of Africa in them is minimal, if not non-existent. Not to mention there are people who would be considered, you know, a, a dark black skin who are Hispanic, who are just really, really deeply tanned, who aren't what we would consider African in any way, shape, or form. So that works, but it doesn't necessarily work, and there's there's issues with that. Um, black is okay, but it's kind of, or supposedly, I don't know if it's still okay. It's hard to know what's still okay, right? Uh, or And what was okay in 2018 is not so okay in 2021. And again, as, as a writer, as a playwright, as someone who loves words, the idea that words can change and morph and be malleable, I love that. But the idea that, you know, a word that was meant to be really perfectly nice and safe and stable, suddenly, because a couple of people take umbrage, are, are, are like, well, no, nah, not so much. So, um, you know, if you say, and this is hysterical, and I had this in a class I was teaching, a white kid, it was, it was this is an English composition class a couple of years ago, white, white kid wrote a very nice paper about this was... Was Black Lives Matter already happening at that point? I mean, the, the police shoot, it, it, I don't know if they were calling it that yet, but the Colin Kaepernick thing had happened. There, there were black unarmed people being shot by police. And so at one point in the paper, he referred to them as colored people. And he didn't mean anything by it, right? But I could, as soon as I read those words, I, I hedged. And I was like, eh, you know, I had that little internal alarm. As, as a white person, so, uh, or as any person, colored people. And it sounded, instantly you hear that, and you think Archie Bunker, 1974. And it was like, he was, uh, you could, when he said it, you're know, like, oh, you, know, you colored people you know, at the factory, the loading dock. Um, yeah. But the irony and the, the weirdness, the ridiculousness of it is, and, and I, very, very carefully had this discussion in class, was saying, mm, colored people, it has a weird feeling if you use that phrase. However, however, the preferred phrase is people of color. <laughs> and what are people of color? Colored people. I, explain that to me. <laughs> you know, explain how colored people feels wrong, but people of color is the nicest, best thing you can say. And they are literally mirror images of each other. Literally, you know, they would refer to each other in a, a thesaurus. Right? But now, people of color uh, has come under fire also. Because it's kind of like, well, you know, essentially, essentially you're still ostracizing and compartmentalizing one group of people. And it's like, oh, it's, it's a great way for white people to set themselves apart and everybody else from Asians or whatever, they're just lumped in. They're all, oh, they're all people of color. Let them be, right? So you got to be now careful with that. But then what else do you, especially if you don't know the race or ethnicity of another, but you can't tell if they're Nigerian or Somalian or if they're from, you know, Upper Northern Siberia, where they're like, I mean, um, <laughs> this is why I know about geography. So it's like, that. and then, and then, and then, and this is the most magnificent word of all. Um, among the words that Brandeis University warns us to be careful about, and this is true, apparently, according to this list. Picnic. Picnic. Somebody wake up William Inge and tell him to change the title of his play. No longer Picnic. Why? Why? Well, because this could trigger people because back in, uh, you know, the early part of the last century, white people, mostly in the South, would get together, find uh, some black people, lynch them, kill them, torture them, and while they were doing it, it would become this great outdoor celebration. And they, and they just come out for an afternoon. It's like, okay, we're going to spread out some chicken and waffles and desserts and sandwiches and lemonade 
and, and you know, the stuff that they would eat down there, squash. And while we're doing this, oh, the, the thing was a hanging. The raison d'etre was watching some black people who got uppity die in front of us. And we'll, you know, we'll laugh, we'll have a great time, we'll cut them down, and we'll, we'll have our dessert. So these, essentially, on some level, the word picnic and the idea of a picnic got tied to the murder uh, of blacks by whites in the South. And then like, it became uh, sort of a, a communal party time. I get that that's upsetting. I do. But to suddenly worry about using the word picnic to, to talk about, like, going on a date in the nearby park with a girl or a boy of your choice, uh, you know, filling a basket with peanut butter sandwiches and, you know, a little, maybe a little pot of tea. Uh, you, you picnic your way, I'll picnic mine. Uh, maybe some roast meats, uh, more my speed. Uh, an apple, or whatever, a blanket, always gotta have the blanket. A little bit of raid bug spray and having a picnic. Having a picnic that they've had in parks all over the world for centuries. In fact, as a matter of fact, the word picnic has nothing to do, and this is another thing, people were thinking, oh, well, all the words, see the word picnic, it was really picnic, so that, that came from that, or picanini, it's close, it's that word, it's simple as that. No, it was a French word, picnic, picnic, having a repast of some kind. It was started in the late 1600s, or, or maybe even early, excuse me, um, you know, to, to refer to a nice outing involving food. And yet, now, we're supposed to somehow... Th you know, I'm, I'm trying to think, I, I should have, you know, brainstormed this before the show, but it would literally... What would it, be? It, would be, it would be like um, Jews getting angry about the word star. Why? Because during the Holocaust, Jews, of course, had to wear yellow stars on their uniforms, or if they were in the ghetto, or if they were in Europe or Eastern Europe, they would have to wear you know, yellow stars to identify themselves as Jews. So Holocaust survivors or, or um, children of Holocaust survivors, relatives, they would be triggered by the word stars because immediately they would see the yellow star on the uniform and oh my god, the Holocaust and the dead Jews and, and, and the world didn't care and so forth. I mean, to me, it's, it's about that silly. It's like, no, no, the Nazis were horrible. <laughs> no. The collaborators were horrible. Jews were forced to wear these stars in that context, in that time. And it was terrible. But then to pluck the generic word star from that and then say, oh, be careful when you use that word. If you're in astronomy class, call it a cluster of visual gases which is kind of what I warn my wife about after I've had beans. But, you know, it's a cluster of gases in the sky. Uh, don't, don't use the S word. Now, yellow star. All right, now we're to, if you're saying, oh, look up in the sky, there's a yellow star. Maybe a little closer? Not sure about that. But, you know, it's just, it just bugs me. And again... Again, with, with respect to Brandeis and the people there, it's just a recommendation list. It's just a, a list to get white people, mostly, to think even more deeply about white privilege and who we are. And to, to when you're using words, sometimes you don't even think that you're going to trigger somebody with a word, but, but there you go. But at the same time, I mean, just, you know, guys, guys, enough. Enough with the cancel culture. Enough with the pre-censoring thought. Enough, and I talked about this last week about my play, about having to change or, or being asked, not having to, being very kindly requested to think about a line in there that I might want to change, but that, that you know, ridiculous nonsense. Okay. Now, speaking of playwriting, speaking of people who um, choose their words super carefully, We've got our guest coming in the neighborhood in a minute or two. She is a playwright as well. As a matter of fact, her play, which is If This Be... Oh my gosh, I've got to 
It is a longish title. I've got to get this right. If this be not a good play, then the devil is in it. It's a one-act play that will be performed as part of the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the Red Bull Theater Company Short New Play Festival on July 12th. It's a one night only. I don't even know if they're going to be able to, to show the replay for a couple of nights after that. It's not going to be one of these things where it's live and then it's perpetual. Anybody can watch it because they have to work out deals with, um, with equity and things. But it's, it's <clears throat> Monday, July 12th on the Red Bull Theater Company website. It's pay what you can, $25 donation and up suggested. Her play and my play is going to be part of that too. She's Connie Congdon. We're going to get to her in just a moment, but not before I remind you that this program is brought to you by Hewlett Minuteman Press, the copy kings of Broadway. Speaking of words, look at all these wonderful words. And in honor of Connie Congdon being in the neighborhood, let's let's see just what Hewlett Minuteman does for the for things that they can do for your company with the letter C. Oh, I should have done it this way. This is better. Here we go. They do cake bags and boxes, candle oh sorry, calendars. What the hell is a candle bar? Uh, carbonless forms, catalog envelopes, uh, ceramic mugs. I mean, you have to understand. I'm reading this backwards. Uh, challenge coins. I have no idea what that is. Checks and Christmas and holiday cards. Of course, coasters, complaint tickets, computer stationery, computer compatible forms, and all those different kinds. And of course, copies and courtesy cards and coupons. You at Minuteman Press, if your business needs to get itself out there and to be set up, Properly. Nobody does it like the fine folks of the Hewlett Minuteman franchise, owned and operated by the Toron family since the mid-1970s. I love working with them. They're great people. They do quality work, quality pricing, quality people. And if you tell them Dave sent you, you get 10% off any job, big or small. So give them a call. 516-569-5577. Area code 516-569-5577. Hewlett Minuteman Press. They are the copy kings. Well, I do feel like king of the world here on Dave's Gone By when I get to have cool guests, talented guests, um, and, and fine people like our friend, New friend in the neighborhood who's in a park. She's got to um, unmute so that we hear her. Hold on. She's doing it. She's a playwright, possibly best known for her comedy Tales of the Lost Four Mikans, but has been writing for many, many years, also teaching playwriting for a bunch of years. Um, still need you to, um, to unmute. We'll get there. I wonder if I can unmute her. Um... Let's see if I can do this for her. Uh, I wish I could. Okay. Hi, Dave. I think this is going to be good. Hi, Dave. Hi, Congdon. Okay. Yes, hi, Dave. Are you, yes. are you there in the neighborhood? Hello? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yay. Hey, greetings. Hello, Connie Congdon. How are you? I'm fine, David. Good. Do you like Dave or David? Uh, for the show, I'm Dave. And in Hi, Dave. Life, so there you go. But but let me no. But let me remind people or or tell that for uh, about thirty years you were a teacher at Amherst College. You've done adaptation adaptations of plays by Goldoni and Moliere. Um, and I'm sure you hear this every time you're introduced anywhere. But we'll do it again. Tony Kushner has ranked you as one of the best playwrights in the country. Uh, she's gotten grants from the NEA, the Rockefeller Foundation, and won the Lilly Award for. Uh -huh. career women playwrights. Please welcome woman playwright Connie Condon. Where are you? Is that your, your house? I am, I am in a garden at my friend Betty's house in uh, Amherst, Massachusetts. And um, yeah, that's it. It's, it's not terribly sunny. But can you hear the birds? Oh yeah, I and mean, it's, it's, we're also got an overcast day here, but it looks beautiful there. Is that like a copper beach behind you? I don't know what tree that is. Or uh, no, it's a crab apple. Oh, is it really? Oh, that's so cool. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So here's the here's the deal. Congratulations, because uh, both of us are going to have plays in the Red Bull Theater Company Short New Play Festival. I've been promoting the heck out of it for for obvious reasons. So was this the kind of thing where you saw the call from Red Bull? 
And you and you know, when you start, did you automatically go, all right, let me think of a play, I'll send them one. Have you been sending them one for years? What uh, I was commissioned to write one uh, a few seasons ago, and I did that. And I keep up on their work, but um, I didn't really, let's see, what was the sequence? Oh, I knew the story I wanted to tell. And I thought, I'll do that for Red Bull. Let me see if I can tell this story in, uh, you know, 10 minutes. And <laughs> that's what happened. Uh, the very first draft, I read it with uh, my granddaughter and um, another family member, and we timed it. Yeah. And it came in at just 10 minutes. So then I went back and did some trimming. And in the course of it, rewrote it. And then a few days later, I looked at it again and I rewrote it again. And uh, I hope, uh, I like it a lot. I mean, I like, I like the result. From the very first draft, I liked the play, which doesn't always happen. You oh, know? Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm working on one, a longer piece that I was working on 25 years ago. I thought I had finished it 25 years ago and I didn't. And now I'm going back to it and like I'm changing just everything. I'm still slogging through it. As opposed to the play that I wrote for this thing, that, that came real quick. This this was like one of those, um, it, w w with me, the whole Red Bull thing is every year I've been submitting and one time yeah. the finalist and nothing. And then all the other years, like, thank you, no thank you. Thank you, but no thank you. And and at this point, I just look. I'm like, oh, they have another contest to hell with. You know, I, I delete the email. And then a, a day later, my brain starts going, all right, let me look at that email again. And, and yeah, I, yeah. Oh, wait a minute. And something sparked. And was you know, having somebody waiting for a play and knowing it's going to be read uh, pretty quickly is a tremendous um well that's if you're commissioned that's the commission thing that's, that's the commission but this one i just sent in and furthermore i had the uh i had the deadline wrong so i'm working away da, 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 and i look and the deadline is like immediate and so i emailed um the head of red bull who is it's not somebody I that, you know, I think we're friends now, but and just said, oh, my God, I need another 12 hours. That's all. And he said, oh, that's fine, Connie. Just email it directly to me. And I brought it in much sooner than that. They say things like by midnight, right, but yeah, that's yeah. just when they want it all to stop so they can print these things out and read them. So I don't know if they print out or read them on the screen because uh, I've done both and it's a different reading experience. But um, anyway, so that's what happened. And I thought, whew, and uh, I got it in and, um, yeah, and it had, had something about the Red Bull Theater in the story, which works with the story I'm telling. and. How? Well, the, the play is called If This Be Not a Good Play, Then the Devil Is In It. What is the play actually about? Well, first of all, the title is from Thomas Decker, a contemporary of all these guys who all knew each other and worked on each other's plays. Um, so, uh, yes, of course, Marlowe and Shakespeare were best buds. It was definitely a bromance uh, but they worked very hard, um, and uh, Marlowe was his, was Shakespeare's, well, they, they were the same age, let me just say that. Well, so You wrote a play where Marlowe was kind of, after Shakespeare's, uh, more than a friend kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah, and it, but it's not, it's, uh, it's more of a, you know, homo homosexual relationship, homosexual sex was seen in a different light for most centuries until the like the last two. Oh, I guess I need to say three, don't I? And in America, where all sex, I think, is ultimately questioned. Uh, and then, you know, gay sex, oh my God, it's, it's just for pleasure. 
Oh, and then the whole, I don't need to go into it, but um, uh, it's, it's seen as a terrible sin, really, really bad sin, beyond just adultery, uh, and it's beyond fornication. So um, it was seen as really negative. In the Elizabethan era, men had sex with each other. It was, it wasn't accepted, but it wasn't. They didn't kill you for it, yeah. as as uh, Marlowe says to Shakespeare uh, after Marlowe's gone into the future and come back and said, well, you know, they have more names for us, but they, you know, they still hate us, but we have more names. So, um, but, but you're saying they weren't that hated back then. It was kind of, it was sort of under the rug. It wasn't a terrible thing. Yes, this then. is, yeah, it wasn't a terrible, it wasn't, no, no. So, but, but yeah. that was, that was your Shakespeare Marlowe play. This yeah, I'm sorry. I, I crossed over. I, they yeah. kind of meshed together. Um, yeah, so this this play takes place uh, uh, after Marlowe's death, and uh, Shakespeare is writing on his own with the help of the actors, as always. And uh, what happens, this is really based on something that really happened. The landlord uh, raised their rent to such an extent that they they just couldn't make the payments and the theaters were closed uh, because of plague and because of the roundheads and um, that's the Puritans. So nobody was making any money. Uh, and they, the theater was going to be closed. So uh, the theater was called the theater. It was built by, uh, by, uh, you know, the uh, Burbages, there was Richard Burbage, who was Shakespeare's major actor, and Cuthbert, who was more of a manager. Uh, and then their father, whose name was something ordinary like William, I think. Anyway. Um, it's interesting that they built it in the city and not the Burbs, but there you go. It, well, this is the deal. Um, I don't know why they built it where they did, but the rents went up and they were gonna to have to close it. So what happened one night is, or it may have been more than one night, but the, the whole troupe, the actors, everybody got together, dissembled, took apart the theater and it's just a pile of lumber. And then they hired uh, people on barges called I think they were called something that starts with a WH. Uh, Whereys, Whereys, okay. not fairies, but Whereys. Okay. And to carry the lumber across, they carried it across to uh, Bankside and they reassembled it. And with a little more lumber, they made the globe. So that is what happened. And it was all done at night. Um, and I just love the brilliance of it and the problem solving and the desperation of it. Yeah. So the play covers the idea of that or the results of it? No, it actually covers the night when they transport the lumber on the wherries across the Thames to Bankside. Oh, that's so, cool. Yeah. And... Um, they haven't rebuilt this other theater yet, and they don't have a name for it. At the end of the play, they still don't have a name, even though Lethe, who is on the banks of the Thames, um, because she, as she admits, she's lost her river, the, the river Lethe, and she's on the banks of the Thames and trying to get people to get on her boat so that she can take them into oblivion. Oh. So the Tims won't give you oblivion, but she can. If you touch her, you will forget everything. You will forget your whole life. Wow. And you can start anew. Do you have her address? <laughs> yeah, I know. I Yes. <laughs> Lethe, taxi, Lethe. Yeah, right. oh, um, 
They have the, so, the Lethe Uber. It's it's a whole subset. Of yeah, it's a. You know what? It is the Lethe Uber, and uh, I love that. I had a character in another play of mine. I named Uber Beth, Uber Beth, which means the ultimate caretaker. So uh, yeah, it's uh, it's an Uber, and she's trying to get people. Uh, you know, into the boat because she thinks they need oblivion and she's immortal. So that's kind of a problem. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, being immortal is has got to be really boring. I mean, as far as she is concerned, it's, yeah, well, it's boring. It would have been until like Netflix. And now I can see it being, you know, a, a possibility. A possibility. Yeah, if you Netflix can. Netflix and Spotify immortality, I, I can manage it, I think. Yeah, as long as you have enough. You can remember enough cultural references to make sense of the stories. Uh, if, if you think about having no cultural references because your mind has been erased, oh, uh, then and you're watching Netflix and you're thinking, what the hell is going on? Yeah, you're probably so, better off with Hulu. Uh, pardon? You're probably better off with Hulu in that circumstance. Yeah, yeah. Now, that Hulu would work, <laughs> not so much Netflix. No, so so I want to talk about some other stuff with our guest playwright, Connie Congdon. So here's the deal. When when did you write your very, very first play? It was 1976, and my son was in kindergarten. So uh, he was... Uh, we got him on the bus in the morning and the bus stopped right in front of our house. So I got him on the bus and he went off to kindergarten. And then when the bus came back, I'd hear those air brakes, you know, the, and I know yes. oh, Sam's back. And I would just put away my work, which I was doing. And I was writing uh, at that point in longhand on the kitchen table in, uh, you know, just ordinary notebook paper yeah. and I fold it up wherever it was and Sam would be home and I'd fix him lunch and uh, I'd take him if it was a nursery school day I'd take him to nursery school and we would um, he would I, I would then have the afternoon free I wouldn't go back to writing though uh, because I, I took uh, the sort of spillover basic English courses from um, the Department of Humanities there at the well, small you were college. already at Amherst, what were you teaching then? No, no, this was in St. Mary's County of Maryland, yeah. which for a girl from the High Plains of the West was just phenomenal. And I wouldn't let my husband uh, remove any of the things I thought might be flowering. And so our property didn't look very good, but I, I just couldn't believe how things grew. And, you know, we had water around us and, um, you know, it was just a totally different culture. So uh, the school was St. Mary's College, College of Maryland. And I'm still close to a lot of those people because uh, I don't know, we, I was very young and we bonded tremendously uh, with students and some of the teachers. So that's when I realized I could teach English and I liked it. I'm talking basic, yeah. what they call bonehead English, which I then ended up teaching for seven years at UMass while I was getting an MFA so that I could continue to teach because I had found in the works of my people, my trade. So uh, that meant I could be a writer. So this first play, I knew if I finished it in time, I could give it to this friend of mine, Betty Osborne, who affected hey, uh, a lot of people. The uh, American Elizabeth, Theater Critics Association has a um, has a, an award based on her there, like the Osborne. That's right, M. Elizabeth Osborne. That's correct. So, and she loved new work, and so she told me that if I finished a play in time, she would produce it. And I did, and she did. And that first play was Gilgamesh. Oh, man, uh, yeah. I was, it was 1976, and I think the production was 77. But <clears throat> I had fallen in love with Joseph Campbell. I read The Hero with a Thousand Faces, 
And then uh, I, that's how I found the story of Gilgamesh, which I just loved, but it's a huge story. And so I just used this one part of it where his friend Enkidu um, dies, he just dies, you know, and Gilgamesh can't accept the fact that here he is king of the world, the Sumerians, his best friend could die and he won't give the body up and his mother has to come and, you know, say, get out of here. And, and then Gilgamesh goes to the underworld to find the flower of eternity. And um, he finds it, but then, oh, let's, you know, read uh, read the story of Gilgamesh. That's yeah, what I'm going to say. Does yeah. it bring you ready to see there too? I mean, it's just there's a whole bunch of things down there. Yeah. He, exactly, and uh, yeah, and yeah. and he has Gil, mainly Gilgamesh has to accept the fact that death really happens. Um, and uh, Betty did this incredible different friend Betty. This is my friend oh. Betty, who's not a director, who is also an English teacher. So we make a cabal, all of us. Um, so Betty did an incredible production. She knew a lot of people in the professional theater. She called in, she got Fred Brown, who was a major costume designer to design and make the costumes. And she had original music, uh, composed and, uh, it was played on by this wonderful musician who was a percussionist and uh mainly and he would he had different size jars like mayonnaise jars big pickle jars on on a towel and if he hit them with a timpani stick they made this gorgeous sound and he made up a lot of the music this was 1977 this was it was really ahead of its time um and this was done in in maryland in, yeah. Yeah, Marilyn in, in St. Mary's at St. Mary's College, which I think still has a really good theater department. So and the designer um, did this phenomenal job. And you know, it just it totally in, in, other words, in, in terms of having your very first play. Now you write it, you have automatic guaranteed production, and the production is fantastic. It doesn't give you know, has it has anything in your life matched that? experience yeah, i am happy to say yes yes right. yes all right good yes yeah, such a i've been very fortunate in that regard and even though so gilgamesh was it was based on the story of gilgamesh but i had obviously it was original so it was one of those i wouldn't call it an adaptation i never called it an adaptation it's like my version of gorky's uh vasa Zelizhnova, uh, which I called a mother or the mother. Uh, and this was at ACT in San Francisco, incredible production. And that really was mine. Um, I did so much work on it that the story and the basic characters were from Gorky, but the most, the play I would say is mine. And Olympia Dukakis, yeah. bless her heart, played Vasa, which is the mother. Let me ask so, you, well, yeah. when you're doing, because um, I didn't know you were adapting also Russian pieces, but when you're doing French and, and Italian, was it the point where, when, do you know those languages and you were doing yeah. adaptation translation or did you work solely from English translations of the plays and then? I got my own translations. So the valuable thing is another one of my colleagues, Virginia Scott, uh, was the expert on Moliere. And uh, so I commissioned a literal translation and then I put it into verse. So the Moliere's, um, I, I've done the four big plays, uh, the one that's probably was the most successful that has had more productions is the Tartuffe, although the Misanthrope has also. Well, those are the most My, popular Moliere plays by anybody. You know, Richard Wilbur is going to be, you know, those two first before Imaginary Invalid and, and his own. Yeah, career. so well, I thought my job there was to not be Richard Wilbur, which actually is quite easy for me because 
He is a fucking brick. Can I say the F word? Yeah, you can. Oh, can go on. Absolutely. Oh, okay, David. Yeah. You know, obviously he was a fucking brilliant poet. I had the pleasure of actually getting to know him and him addressing me my my first name. And, you know, he just, it, what a mensch. Oh. Lovely, lovely man. So but I thought my job was just to have my verse versions. That's what we decided to call it. My new verse versions, not be Richard Wilbur. So I made some, uh, you know, I luckily knew those plays. I had been at the Hartford stage working with Mark Lamos and we did a production of The Misanthrope, which was wonderful and I worked on. So I had that in my head. And, um, and then Tartuffe, I had seen versions. No, I, hmm. well, let, let me ask you, uh, Connie, let me, yeah. let me, so um, it's the, the question here of, I don't want to put it in a negative sense of why bother? But what would your Tartuffe or what did your Tartuffe do that was different or what angle did it take that wasn't in this translation and in, in Wilbur's translation? Why did we need your Tartuffe? Well, let me start with the misanthrope. Uh, that was the first one that Wilbur did. He did it in 1953 or four. And it had phrases like by Jove in it. And I thought, not American. Oh. Uh, so I use standard American stage English for the misanthrope. And then for Tartuffe, um, I had a huge amount of fun, but I wanna say in both cases, these were headed into productions at American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco. So the real drive was that I wasn't just doing it, it was, um, you were asked to do it by this particular theater company. I was, and I've got to thank my dear friend, Craig Slate, who uh, ran the Young Conservatory at the, really started the Young, Cons made it what it was, which major training place for young actors. Uh, he's the one that said, you know, Connie could really, she loves, I mean, she's a good poet. Uh, by the way, I started writing poetry, uh, you know, when I was 11. And I still write poetry. So, um, and I remember this experience of being on the airplane on my way home from the meeting where I knew I had the job. And I opened up uh, the book and there's a famous scene. And I thought, I know this scene almost by heart. So I'm going to write this scene for myself in verse. And you know what, Dave, it was just so funny. I mean, it was funny with, with uh, uh, obviously with Moliere, but uh, I modernized it a bit. Tartuffe is, has very few changes because Virginia Scott did this literal translation, which is in prose, which is just brilliant. And she would translate things. I remember this one line was, this can also, this has this inflection, this has this double meaning, and oh gosh, I don't know. So I, and I had all these cultural contexts in the Tartuffe draft. So anyway, on the plane, I just realized I can do this. I like this. I like iambic pentameter. I like rhyming couplets. Yes. So but yeah. the what got me doing it is I was heading into production. I okay. knew I had a production. It wasn't just going to sit somewhere and you know I wouldn't be at the corner of you know 42nd and Broadway going, anybody, anybody want to do my play? Oh, it's yeah. really good. What so, playwright wouldn't have wanted to be like Eugene O'Neill, where you know every couple of months do you have a one act, do you have a whatever? Because you know, we'll do it a week later, we'll we'll stage it. What or someone wanted to be Neil Simon and Manny Eisenberg. It's like, you know, Neil, we've got a Broadway theater open. Are you, I'm, I'm at the third draft. I'll have it done in two weeks. And yes, and it'll be opening on Broadway. Um, how many playwrights would, would kill? You're looking at one for, for that sort of like, we need uh, to a huge stuff. number, honey, a huge number, David. Uh, I was thinking about Neil Simon, who was brilliant in that his first play, full length play, he based it on his own life, and that's Come Blow Your Horn. Which, so because he had Nanny Eisenberg, oh, what? I, I just have to, I have to add, 
um, moment that when I was in high school, high school senior, my yeah. first theatrical anything was playing the father in our high school production of Come Blow Your Horn. Okay, continue, please. That is a great role. And it this is, is the bit that, you know, that, that Neil made clear is that uh, like a lot of, he's a modern American writer and he, he doesn't see extra, you know, people come in and go, there's a telegram, sir. Uh, everybody has a character. Everybody has a background. And that was the way he embraced life. And he saw people very three-dimensionally. And uh, I had nothing but respect for Doc. I would love to have met him and go, Doc, I'm going to call you Doc. You know, it just, um, I, a lot of people thought, oh, and 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 sitcom, they should all just, they need, first of all, putting, yeah. putting down sitcoms and look at the comic brilliance of, of Neil Simon, because it's people, it's people. And he has a comic point of view. It's how he survived. So uh, Austin Yonkers has a real, I could just, you know what? I should shut up because I can just talk about him. No, no, I mean, the, the thing is, I want to ask you so many questions. So as we yeah. go along, I'm like, uh-oh, you know, if that answer goes like five minutes, then I won't have time for this, this, and this. But but I'm, I'm, I'm of the feeling that, you know, Neil Simon has been very unfairly kind of pushed aside and oh he's a white Jew from the 1950s and he wrote that kind of thing and we don't want to hear that anymore yeah. I mean how do you how do you feel right now in this wokeness era where I think we're having seven black plays coming to Broadway in the new season uh, which is great but at the same time are we are we over stressing wokeness and doing something you know brand new shocking in terms of theater well you know, I'm all for wokeness. Um, finally, I mean, when because I worked for a professional theater for seven years, I know that a lot that goes into play selection is there are a lot of plays we love, but ultimately, can we get the director? Can we get the cast? And how does it fit into a season? And ultimately, finally, the most important question is, is this for our audience? So right now what's happened is the audience, even though it's still in terms of percentages, still hugely a white audience, now wanna see black plays. Mm. It used to be, or black written plays. Uh, there's a problem with using the word black, which I was schooled in a few days ago. And well, what, what, so, what's wrong with, I was just talking about this before we went on the air of we can't use people of color anymore because that now has an issue. Color mm -hmm. always has an issue. Black is no, what, what's the word? I, you know, I don't know. Uh, I have uh, black people and a whole portion of my family are black people, obviously not in my DNA, uh, but they are part of our family. Yeah. And I mean, by blood through intermarriage, and then remar then they remarried more black people. So they're not just even half black anymore. And so my cousin Stephanie said to me, black is a good term because it's, it's national nation identity at, because we're Af or, or the family's Afro-Caribbean. So African-American doesn't really fit, but I'm confused. And uh, I just made a terrible mistake in DC in rehearsal and uh, I, I don't know really, I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. I don't think that it's, it's like monolithic, like there, everybody agrees on this at all. But um, I guess I need to be schooled. Yeah, no, I know, but if you're gonna tell us to watch out and don't use this, don't use this, don't use this. Uh, we need the alternative <laughs> or else we're gonna be uh, twisting ourselves. Oh, one moment, yes. Well, yeah, but you can't just, you know, imagine going up to every black person and saying, what would you like me to refer to you as, you know, and, and may I please buy this can of soup? And it's like, you know, not, yeah, you it's buy. not, no, because they would, I don't know. I don't know. I'm trying to figure it out myself. Um, I want to, yeah, I want to be attuned, um, but I've gotten burned because I burned people accidentally. Um, 
Were you holding and, you know, like or, it's it's it's, it's happened twice now, both in the context of the theater. But you meant it, nothing by it. You didn't mean to. I assume you didn't look at someone and say, yeah, oh, like an Eskimo. And you say Eskimo in a, in a nasty way. And, and then they're like, how dare you? I'm an Eskimo you know, or, or something. Yeah, well, they, yeah. And because they're individual tribes and um, I you know what, Dave, I'm puzzled. I need some instruction. So my, the email address I still use because I got terribly hacked is C.S. Congdon, C-O-N-G-D-O-N at Amherst.edu. I would love to hear from playwrights of color, um, which is still used, I think if you, maybe, anyway, I need to be, I need, I need schooling. So I'd love to hear from people. Really, I'm serious. I'm not just like, oh, well, you gave out your no. email address on, on our so C S Congdon, C O N G D O N at first A M H E R S T dot E D U. They let you right. keep your, your college name, so that's really because you're retired, you don't teach anymore, right? No, I'm an Emeriti ta ta tus and I miss my students terribly. I, that term. I don't like the word emeritus. It, it's no just um <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, help so, okay. me. When, yeah. when all these students were coming, you said you love, love, love teaching. What is the one thing that you most wanted to get across to your playwriting, or even your English, maybe it's the same as your English students, but to your students when they put pen to paper or fingers to keys? Do not edit yourself. Write the first draft and do not edit yourself. And particularly, don't pay attention to the voice inside your head that goes, Oh my God, this is crap. Oh no, I just said that in another, don't do any of that. I do all of that. And then I push through and keep going. And because I can get hung up on a word choice, oh, hell yeah. you know, and then go make a sandwich or something. It's the only way to write. And I've written letters of recommendation that way and gotten praised. I give good letters of recommendation because oh, I just start talking about the student. And then you can go back and read it aloud, and then you can do you can do your editing. But if you're editing as you go, forget it, forget it. That is the that's the road to hell, uh, and I mean your own private hell. Oh, I'm in there all uh, the time, Tommy. But let me ask you this: this I've always found different. I'm mean, not that I've had so many readings and things in my life, but back when I was doing um, writing plays in school and stuff, when we have a reading or a production of a show, and it's, it's still like, quote unquote, in the draft stage. I find it really difficult to do anything in the actual reading or viewing of the show to to edit and criticize in my head and see what's working, what's not. I, I'm sort of, I'm so into like, how are the actors doing? Am I having a great time? Am I loving hearing my, my words out there? That, that I find it's a lot easier for me to just read over my play solo and edit that way than to expect the process of readings and the process of workshops to help. How do you feel about that? Well, I had the, and my students, we had the advantage of having a whole class of people. Mm. I mean, a whole room full of people. And from the beginning, I'd say, okay, so if you're not comfortable with white people reading your black characters, then, uh, will, you know, I'll ask people to come in and read. Um, and so we did that a few times. After a while, my my playwrights in class would just, you know, they would cast white people because normally that's the majority just to hear the play. So as soon as actors start saying those words, I, I, I know what I, I know what's wrong or I know where I am. But also the main thing is I ask them after they do the first draft, only the first draft to not change a word so that they can start believing in their own voice because they may cut everything out that is only them. And the idea of voice is a really, it's a, it's a delicate thing. So, um, just leave it there, hear it in front of the audience, the class, and you know, you will, you'll know, you'll know, you start to believe in the right things 
about your play, about the writing. And so we would do that, we'd read it, and then I'd ask the playwright, how did we do? And uh, the playwright would, you know, maybe have a couple of comments, but mainly they were kind of overwhelmed at, you know, how much better it sounded than they thought it did. Ah. Most people, this whole thing of like writers being egocentric, and I don't know where that comes from. Every writer I have known uh, would like to go and sit in the janitor's closet with a little periscope or, you know, a pinhole to, at their first reading. I mean, oh, yeah. You know, it's not like they're going, oh, yes, I'm excellent. They're, you know, just, I'm, I wear the pin. July 12th already. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to be sitting there in front of a computer. Your play is going to be done. I, you know, Jose Rivera's play is going to all these playwrights and myself. And when mine yeah. comes on, I'm li I don't know what what i'll do with myself i'm excited to see it but at the same time i'm like you know oh honey lamb i know the feeling and luckily i've been there enough that i'm expecting a good result but i also had it read by family members who weren't the people in the play at all and you know my daughter reading shakespeare's line my granddaughter reading shakespeare's line lines was really fun and her enjoying it and you hear the voice so um yeah no i mean i i, I envy you that perspective by the way i want to before we start um getting the people in for the today yesterday trivia quiz on dave's gone by i want to remind everybody that we are talking with connie congdon and her email address if you want to talk about um the use of various types of language including black and people of color but anything involving playwriting i hope they can come and and chat or share with connie congdon cs congdon c-o-n-g-d-o-n at Amherst, A M H. Why did it? That's so pretentious not to pronounce the H. Amherst dot edu dot edu for the for, for being a college. So let me ask you before we get the other people in here, the, the the some of the fun stuff I wanted to get to. Like you had, did you have a controversy about um, undergarments in, in terms of um, uh, you know, plastic uh, you know, adult dependy undergarments? that you were talking about with, with <laughs> Yes, I did a piece called Is Sex Possible? And this was about uh, incontinence, which I'm 76 years old. Hello, hello, young incontinence, wherever you are. Um, and I just came out and I did it in Omaha for uh, the uh, that playwriting festival they have, which is just most excellent. But I did it for this audience of board members and other playwrights and actors and sitting in the front uh, at a front you know at a table we set it up like a cabaret so was uh this wonderful woman named eve and eve is one of the family that does that owns omaha steaks and she's an incredible art supporter and she was sitting there and I started talking about my adventures with incontinence and she laughed so hard. She hit her head on the table. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and I said, Oh my God, we've lost Eve. Are you okay? Her husband uh, who's passed away, but also wonderful man set her up and she was fine. And I thought, okay, this is good. But you know, just telling the truth about your life is still, it's still the best material. And I have, um, I, I've used my life all the time. And, you know, as my friend said, my friend, Greg Lemming, who's directed a lot of my plays. And he said, you've got to stop writing about my life because I used his life. And also a lot of his life was parallel to uh, a lot of other people I knew. Sure. So when Greg would tell me a story and I go, oh my God, I've heard that before. Oh, that's a common experience. It goes click. And, you know, I'm sorry. It just comes out in the play. I can't help myself. So for Dave, no, just, uh, just beware if there's a character who is Jewish, has a receding hairline, <laughs> and wears Hawaiian shirts. And by the way, talks a little bit out of the side of his mouth. You see, except that's an actor character. 
เสียงนะคือแค่สุดๆค่ะแค่แค่เราเป็นแซ่บแพลตแต่สไนแอนด์ Oh honey I'm so sorry I've done it again You have offended wonderful Kami Kani has offended the the unoffendable me <laughs> Yes this, this this was surgical uh, you know, well, I didn't see that Oh so you're like Stacy Keach Yes Hot Not quite as handsome as Stacy Not quite as handsome as Stacy So that is the yeah Okay good Well I'm Uh, every day in every way, I manage to say something that just is horrible. Yeah, no, I'm a shy talker for a specific reason, but but I do sometimes talk out of the side of my mouth that intentionally. Well, I you know yes, I do. Yeah, and, and I find it uh, you won't believe me, but I find it kind of sexy. There's a actor whose whole a lot of he gets character roles, and a lot of them is because he he talks out of the side of his mouth. So he's in westerns a lot. And he does this a lot, and uh, hmm. so. It, yeah, but I mean, anyway, the point for writers out there is that's a good one for fiction, but not in a play because you know that's that's not going to help the actor, and it doesn't help the character. So, yeah. All right. Sorry. And oh, totally, no, mention, it's totally fine. It's fine. Okay. I'm, and I'm, I mentioned you were Jewish too, by the way. That was not probably, offended by. Although, although the preferred time uh, term for me is Jew esque. Because I'm not particularly yeah. religious. Person of circumcision is is my preferred term. Oh, uh, what you see, but most white kids, uh, boys are circumcised. So, yeah, but they probably took more off mine. Because if you ever look down there, there's nothing left. But you know, no, I think it's probably because there was so much. They thought, oh, what the hell? Let's get the get that Moyle who has he hasn't had a lot of practice. Let let get him doing it. Oh, somebody stop me, Dave! I've no, started. I will never. No, this is the kind of thing I do not stop on this this program. Okay. So, so speaking of we're speaking of sexual things, you've also written very specifically, as you said, about sex, fifty, sixty, sex. Seventy plus. You you've talked about dating at a certain period. Although now you've settled down, I guess, with your life partner for about a decade or so. How's that going? Yeah. Well, uh, it's going really well. I mean, he's a he's just a great, great guy, and I can say this now: uh, uh, he's polyamorous. So when we got together, he said, "Well, um, you know, there's Jennifer and Betty, and." Uh, Jennifer is off on her own now. Having, she just wants. To, she travels in this gorgeous van she had outfitted, so they still have a deep emotional uh, relationship. But Betty is his other partner, and so the three of us during COVID bonded because we created a pod of three people and. In that, uh, Ron got very ill, and Betty and I. Uh, we're taking turns taking care of him, and we've gotten to the point now where, you know, I'll call and I'll say, "Have you seen our boyfriend?" I'm actually not sure, and she goes, "Oh, I think he's at Lowe's buying more stuff for the garden." Yeah, this is his garden that he put in, and it's just, wow. it's beautiful. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm very, very happy. Because you conceived like, like back when you were first writing that play at the kitchen table and getting your your kid back from school at lunchtime, could you have conceived that you would be part of a, a functional happy throuple in your seventies? I couldn't have imagined my seventies, but yes, that I imagined because I'm part of the sexual revolution. Although it seemed to, uh, you know, there seemed to be a swinging door that somehow I got pushed through. Like in the hospital, you walk out, and the next thing you know, you're out in the street. And uh, so I don't know what happened to the sexual revolution. Oh, I do know. Sexual politics took it over, hmm. and it just got to be. It's just. Uh, thank God I'm not a white male, um, and I I just wouldn't know where to look, as we used to say. Huh. Down home, I just didn't know where to look. Actually, you know? a white male. I can tell you, I still look at tits. So there you go. That's that's where I look. And then Good. Look mostly tits. Hey, uh, yes. Honestly, let's celebrate them. Yes. Oh my God. Yes. You know, I just oh, I the the whole the whole sexual politics thing that uh, dominated feminism and still dominant has too much dominance. Uh, it. it Feminism should be about 
helping poor women get abortions if they need them. Mm-hmm. And okay, part of my family's Catholic, but the really no, there's still a couple out there that would just hate me for saying that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Patty. But anyway, helping. Uh, well, wait, 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 can you not be a feminist and be pro-life? I'm taking the other side here, but um, can you can you not be a, be a feminist and be pro-life? Yeah. I think you can, you know, everybody. Yeah, sure. I mean, why not? You know, you should be able. Feminism, the whole push of it was about choice not about lockstep and it like so many political movements it gets into lockstep and then there's all this this argument about language and that's why i when it came to language i just refused to be edited so um i still refer to myself as a girl i'm an old girl uh you know i i just don't we got off on other topics that about being offended. We're living in a cultural that's all a culture that's all about being offended. So if you're a playwright, you're fucked, okay? Because theater is going to offend people. Please. And yeah, and in some ways, it, unless it's doing it's it's doing its job. So um, one yeah. of my I had so many favorite students, but one of my students, Fatima, was taking a course in playwriting at another college. And her teacher said, now, just be careful. Don't write something that'll hurt someone's feelings. You know, and she was like, taxi, Uber. And uh, she came over to to my class. And so this is a, an African American woman who may be Muslim, I'm not sure. All these tags are like, you know, I I don't know, a human. Anyway, Fatima, hi, sweetheart. Um, So yeah, she came over to my class and we had this thing of like no editing. And so if you say something that's real, if if a character, if it comes out and it's like really like, whoa, then, uh, you know, by that, I mean, offense offensive whatever that means first of all i think number one you're doing your job secondly we talk about it we just are open and we talk about it uh i I don't think people are talking about anything anymore there's just like okay there's okay that that was yeah wrong wrong. Uh Um, and Honey, you're freezing. I'm done with, with you. you. Click. Defriend. Hmm. Uh, um, Honey, I need you to, to hold up because basically, I don't know if you're hearing me. Writer in chat. Writer in chat. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm just going to type, Connie, you're freezing. Um, it, her, her internet was fantastic for the whole thing, and then it started going kind of kablooey. Let me get to my chat window. Um, hi, Connie. You're frozen there. Meanwhile, Connie, I, um, I don't know if she hears me, but David Sheward is hi. with us. Hello, David. How are you doing? Hi, sorry. Um, welcome, welcome to the okay. neighborhood. Hi. But, oh, I'm, I'm hi, sorry. Okay, this could not be because this is the best part. And uh, can you see me? Now, yeah, now, okay, we, we got better again. That's Connie Congdon, by the way, David Sheward, playwright Connie Congdon. Um, Connie, this is David Sheward. Hello. You can always text her and chat. Hi, another Dave. Dave, David. Hi, David. how are you? David Sheward is the former president of the Drama Desk. He is also a blogger for the David Desk and theater, like.com and culturaldaily.com. And, and we do have knockwood and, and connie i think we're you're unfrozen i think you're fine okay, we'll let you make your point in a minute but we also want to get um our other friend of the neighborhood uh director and uh, theater critic leslie hobang blake is trying to log in as well to do the so while leslie's logging in because that usually takes about five or ten minutes uh kind if you want to finish your point that, that'd be that'd be great because i missed okay we're frozen we missed so much of it yeah 
Yeah, what was what was I talking about? Oh, I have no idea. I was busy texting you. So, or, 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 you know. yeah, so I'm, you know, um, uh, I, yeah. so I don't have the text because I'm outside. What happened is the wind happened and um, it may have, but you can hear me now. Okay. I can, I can yes. hear you. You're not frozen. You're fabulous. You now. David, you're set. Okay. Nancy, I see her name and that's it. So we'll see. Uh, uh, so the uh, the point I was making is these are tough times for a playwright because you know you have your characters say things and then people think that's you saying them when you're just your character. Uh, yeah, I you know when I never thought that William Shakespeare uh, was Iago. I just don't think that's him. I that is he. I think he's still an English teacher. I think that you know he created a character. And I don't think Eugene O'Neill was Huey, although he used himself a bit. It's that we're in this. It's just it's difficult for playwriting right now. Okay. I mean, I, but I, I don't live. Um, uh, speaking of Jewish people, I work with a fellow named uh, Rabbi Saul Solomon. And there's this crossover line where it's like people think it, and it is, you know, there's more of me in there than they want to acknowledge because there are things that he says that I actually believe in, but they say, oh, we, oh, he's just joking. We don't have to listen to that. When it's like, no, no, I wrote that part, and I meant that part, but if you want to take him as joking, yeah, go ahead. You know. So, But there is that weird line we're crossing. There's a very weird line. There seem to be lines all around. Uh, oh, I know. I was talking about Caitlyn Jenner. So oh. I created, I put this on Facebook. Hi, uh, it's Connie, but I've always felt racially dysmorphic. So I've decided to become black. I'm taking melanin and my skin is darkening. Um, you know, I'm eating only soul food and whatever the hell that is. I'm eating only soul food and getting takeout from Sylvie's. Um, Wait, did, did you get hate mail for that satire? I mean, what, you know. Oh, honey, you have no idea. It was, I, I said, I'm using, I've. I've spent the last month reading all about uh, African American history, so I think I, I absolutely about everything about what it's like to be black. Uh, and um, so the first person I heard from was Levy Lee Simon, who is African American. Okay, that's his name. He got his last name is Simon. His first name is Levi because of of the Bible and Lee and. Anyway, he said, Dear Connie, I'm sitting at the Starbucks, the corner of 42nd and 9th, laughing my ass off, and people are looking at me. So, love you, Levy uh, Lee. Well, that, after that, that's pretty much the only uh, positive thing I heard. The rest was from former students who will only increase the racism in this country, should be taken down immediately. And here I am, a mother. I mean, that's what I, I I love my students. I defriended one of them just immediately. I just thought, okay, defriend. I can't even begin. If he didn't learn about irony and satire and what an incredible weapon it is, I I I I, I can't. Well, I just but actually, can't. I'm still. I, I have to say, I'm a little bit confused. I mean, were you making fun of Caitlyn Jenner turning into a woman? What were you mm -hmm. making fun of? But I was making fun of, yes, I was. I was making fun of Caitlyn Jenner deciding, and then her supporters deciding that she was now a woman because she'd been taking these hormones. She still had a penis. That's and right. yeah, so my point was, you know, you haven't even begun to understand what it's like to be a woman. And I hadn't even gotten into the menstruation issue, which uh, is a huge one. Yeah. I, I, I don't think unless you menstruate that you can begin to understand what being a woman is. So I'm ready to take the hate mail, but I'm okay with that. I'm more interested in, in how do I, uh, the other thing I asked about where I use the term black referring to an actor who is black and I was accused of being um, uh, more than a racist, a white supremacist. So 
Well, the yeah. actor was Arnold Stang, so I really don't understand the. No. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Arnold, he was just trying to take somebody's. You know, he was trying to support the. Uh, oppressed there you go look I mean, i'm gonna stop you here just okay. because just because it's time we have our people here yay yay okay david sure so sorry i don't know why it's so difficult to get on this i really don't i think somebody just trying trying david. what sorry david what i know i was just saying someone needs a new internet or something yeah yeah it's uh, it's I don't know. Maybe it could be. Anyway, that's <laughs> good morning, well. Connie. I don't know if you recall, but you and I were on some woman in theater thing or other over the years. Oh, I'm sure. Leslie Hoban. Leslie Hoban Blake. Blake. So are you related to Russell Hoban? Oh, uh, no, and good. I'm not related to Phoebe Hoban. I'm related to James Hoban, who designed the White House. Wow. Yeah, except we discovered that he had seven slaves who helped build it, so we're not so proud of it anymore. <laughs> well, yeah, well, a lot. It was built by slave labor, and it was his slave labor that he brought them with. I mean, he bought them here, and then he, because they didn't have them in Ireland. But and he didn't he, call uh, them people of color, so it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah he you called them right. by the right term, and that made everything all right. Yeah, because he, yeah, I can't even. Oh, God, the Irish, the Irish. The Irish, I know, Con. It goes back to um, Barry Lyndon. James Hoban was one of those, the arist aristocratic Irish. Yeah, so he was the Anglo-Irish, the Anglo-Irish. But, but they came over early with skills. My my grandfather, the, the very distant relation, was part of the potato famine group of Irish yeah, who came um, over with no skills whatsoever. Potato. Yeah, you my, know, uh, my third grade and... <laughs> Mary Jameson, uh, Mary Jameson uh, had enough nourishment to get on a boat and get over here. So, so that's uh, why you're here. Well, there are lots of other relatives who came earlier, and as we uh, f uh, we have been told, we also had some ancestors who met met quote the boat. Really? Um, yeah, uh, but I did DNA. It turned up in my my son's DNA and then it turned up in my grandson's DNA because it isn't in the mitochondrial out of my depth here but I'll keep talking anyway um it's it's she not carry words around so well yeah. well she's she of course she does you know that's, that's the point let me let me it is just about 11 o'clock eastern time here in the neighborhood you're watching dave's gone by with me dave lefkowitz it's our 804th episode we're calling it pros and cons in honor of connie congdon we've got leslie hoban blake we've got david Stewart. we have connie congdon all here to play the today yesterday trivia quiz that we do every week so connie since you are the the new guest in the neighborhood we're going to let you Make the first call in terms of pick a number, please, between one and six, and tell us what it is. Uh, four. Connie says four. Uh, and then let's see. Is it is it feminist to ask Leslie to go second <laughs> to choose second, or is it more feminist well, that I treat you guys equally? Didn't you, didn't feminist you, didn't... to ask Leslie what she'd like to do. No, <laughs> well, did win last week, and therefore I should get the pick. That's right. Yeah. Leslie took the crown. She won the game. No, I did game. not. I did not take the crown. Oh, no, it was Vicky uh, Cloggy. Vicky, Vicky, Vicky took the crown. Oh, oh, that's Vicky right. I'm sorry. I was a half a point off or something. Yeah. Did she score more? So how do you how do you how do you answer the question? Uh, we'll just all be shouting the answer, won't we? No, I'll, I'll oh, no, give, no, I'll, no, no, I'll no. David me. has rules. Everybody has rules. Okay. It's not, it's not a free fall. Uh, 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 there's uh, a director involved. Me. But so I <laughs> Leslie had the most points last, more points than me last week. So yes. uh, that's that's it. I I didn't win, but I did have more points. She came in second. So I they, should get to choose the next number. Okay. Sure, you should, David. We'll David. call you Doctor David Sue from now on. <laughs> no, no, I'm trying to be fair. Not just, I'm not David Sue, like, pick a number between. I'm not trying oh, to be a victim. Sorry, Connie, that was an inside joke. You'll get. I'm not trying to be. A, I'm not playing the victim card. It's uh, okay. No, oh, not much. <laughs> uh, I will pick three. David Schuert picks the number three, and Leslie, are you six or two? You're usually... Well, you know, today is the 26th. Two to six are both my lucky numbers. So, having said that, I'm going to lose. Um, I will, And I took two last week, so I'll take six this week. 
Leslie with the big number six. All this means, Connie, let me explain the rules to you uh, quickly okay. on the game. It's called the Today Yesterday Trivia Quiz. We have questions, three rounds of three questions, plus a tiebreaker. Uh, we do the tiebreaker anyway, even if it's, it's, you know, if it's the uh, winners of Beta Compli. But each question is worth two points. If the contestant gets the question right, you get two points. If you don't, one of the other two contestants has the chance to steal and get those two points. You can answer a question wrong, there's no penalty, but you don't get any points. Now, the reason for the numbering is the way we start the game is I roll a virtual pair of dice, or no, sorry, a virtual die, a single die, which I'm going to roll as we speak, and the number comes up, boxcar number six. So, Leslie, oh. Hogan, like you get to decide, do you want to go first, second? Oh, first, or... please, David, first. I never get to go first. Well, you do today. You do indeed. <laughs> and, and you're going to give me a question about 376 or 12, 1292 or some weird date like that, right? Okay. Uh, kind of, yeah. Yeah, that first. I the know. Next, the next roll is number four, which is, which is Connie's number. Connie chose four. So, Connie, would you rather go second or third? Uh, I'd like to go second. Sure. Good girl. I like it. I'll go this second. <laughs> You bring up the rear for the third question. And so, and Connie, let me ask you right now while I have it in my head, because we'll have David, to David, you bring up the rear. Is that offensive? I just need to check. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. No, my hair is just wet. So, Connie, oh, okay. by any chance, I know you're sitting in the, in the yard in a garden. Do you have a pen and paper? You don't need it now, but you might She's have... a playwright. Of course she's got a pen and paper. <laughs> or, or you can ask Come one. On. Yeah. Betty. <laughs> oh wait a minute! You will need the second. You will need it uh, in a little bit. Wow. Okay, I'm diving for it now. That will be for the tiebreaker. Uh, you know when when we do that. But until then, we're good. And Leslie Hoban Blake gets the very first question of today's today yesterday quiz. On I'm this finally team. awake. I got home Thursday night. I didn't. I slept all day yesterday. Oh no! Home from. Oh, I went to visit my kids in Connecticut. Oh, and how I had the greatest doing? time. Yay. Greatest time. Did you we went on a little there? schooner in, 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 in the Connecticut River? Yeah. A, a little, uh, like, it could hold 20 people schooner kind of thing. And, yeah, it was great. I just, we had a great time. That's wonderful. Yeah, yeah, were you there there. or you just, you just went? Uh, I'm not on the schooner, no. Um, it's very funny in Connecticut. It's a kind of a, a yes, we wear masks, no, we don't wear masks situation. And so we just have masks with us at all times. Oh, that, well, that, yeah, <laughs> so many so of us. You need them. See, oh, she's got a beautiful right. pad. Look at that, because she's yeah. a playwright. <laughs> so, Leslie. Oh, yes. right. the one other thing, Connie, is that every question, the point of the, the piece, it's called Today, Yesterday, since today is June 26th, everything we're asking about happened on June 26th in history. Could have been oh, 50 God. years ago, 150 years ago. But the questions, some of them are real trivia, others you just guess. It's all in fun. There's no problem. Let me catch let me catch Connie up. Connie, it doesn't matter what the year is or the question, because David will find a way around it. And although the question will be something about that, it's gonna be off to the left side of it. So don't worry about it. None of us know how to figure this out. Yeah, it's okay. fine. You're, you're a good company. Fine. Thank you. David, I have your shirt on, on a on a pillow. What? I have your shirt on a pillow. Well, Could someone get that, please? <laughs> I got it. I have your shirt on a pillow. People know better than to call me now. So, Leslie Hoban Blake, are you ready for question number one? Sure. Yay. Okay, here we go. And you were right. We begin in that wonderful year, 1284. <laughs> I was close. <laughs> oh, yes, you remember it well. According, oh, God. <laughs> well, according to legend, June 26th, this is the date that a vengeful, a vengeful Pied Piper led the children of Hamlin away where they never be seen again. According to Merriam-Webster's, what does the pied in Pied Piper actually mean? It's a multiple choice. Is it A, covered with pie, <laughs> B, wearing shoes, C, multicolored, D, tricky? This is very funny. Um... I'm going to go with multicolored. It could be pied because that could be close to fed, which is 
foot, but I'm going to go with multicolored. Is that your final answer? Yeah, that's the one that makes sense to me. Well, I hope this isn't offensive, Leslie, because we are people of multicolor, but that is the correct answer. You oh, wow. do get two points, Leslie Oldman, like pie is, is, you know, has to do with colorful. Yay! I just every time, I used to be a children's librarian way back in the day, and when we had pictures of the Pied Piper of Hamlin, he was always dressed in like a like a court jester outfit with all of those tails coming out in all colors. So that's what I went for. Well, well done. Let's cut yourself a slice of pie. You are on the board with two points. Leslie Hoban Blake getting the first question in our quiz. We now move to the second question, which goes directly to Connie. Connie, are you ready? I'm ready. All right, here we go. The year we move all the way up to 1870 for another multiple choice. Opening to the public today is the first section of the Atlantic City Boardwalk. Just 10 years later, the Freilinger's Company opened there, and they're still there, selling saltwater taffy. Which of these is not a flavor in Freilinger's current roster? Is it A, licorice, B, blueberry mint, C, tea berry, D, pina colada? Oh, my God. Will you read those again, please? You betcha. So, yeah, Franklin Church, 10 years after today, they opened on the Atlantic City Boardwalk. They're still around, although they're owned by the James Company now. Which of these do they currently sell? Is it, uh, I'm sorry, is, do they not currently Which of these is not a current flavor? A, okay. licorice, B, blueberry mint, C, tea berry, D, pina colada. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, C, tea berry. So I'm not really sure what the hell it is. So if I were standing there, I'd go licorice. Pro oh, that's been there for three million years. Blueberry mint. That's interesting. I might do that. And a tea berry. It's a, mm. and then the last one is uh, pina colada. Oh, pina colada. That's the one I would get. So anyway, I'm going to go with. Uh, 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 the, the uh, tea berry. I don't think they would. I don't think they sell that. Am no. I right? Connie, uh, I was hoping the answer would suit you to a T, but no, that is not the correct answer. There, um, oh, correct. there is actually a tea berry flavor of the saltwater taffy. So I'm going to roll the die to see who gets the chance to steal this question. And it comes up, uh, speaking of, of uh, depends undergarments, it comes up with a number two. Yes, I always have to make one of those jokes. Ladies, oh, and that is closer to David Stewart. Uh, so David, don't you have an air conditioner? What the hell's going on over there? You got the fan and you go like... I've got like, the fan on. I've got the fan on. Yeah, okay. But you keep going like, oh, like you're, you're accomplishing a Vic. What's going on? Okay? Maybe I should put on the air conditioner. Yeah. Anyway, but ahead. before you put on the air conditioner, how about uh, taking a stab at this? All right. Question? So it's which of these is not a saltwater flavor, a saltwater taffy flavor? From Freilinger's, yeah. And what are my choices? Is it A, licorice? B, blueberry mint, or D, pina colada? Huh. I was going to say it's probably not blueberry mint because those two don't sound like they go together. And it's probably something like raspberry mint or something like that. <laughs> or something like, you know, gooseberry mint. Uh, so I'll say it's uh, blueberry mint is not a flavor. Is that your final answer? Yes. And, well, I guess this week you won't have the blues, David Sheward. That is the correct answer. Blueberry mm. mint is not, is not a natural flavor. They do have molasses mint. Uh, uh, I, was, I, I always hope they have barium mint. That would be a <laughs> <laughs> Yes, David Sheward, it's a tie game now. Leslie and David both on the board and here's okay. the deal though this is where david gets sneaky because he gets the next question directly oh. so you can build on your lead uh, on your lead excuse me okay this one though is not a multiple choice Are all right ready? okay june 26th 1900 is the year after returning from investigating tropical diseases in cuba this military physician starts putting together a research team Together, they figure out how yellow fever is transmitted. Okay. Name that doctor who, years later, was posthumously honored on a five-cent postage stamp. Oh. oh. 
Oh, well, I do remember there was a movie called, or a play called Yellow Jacket. Uh oh. Uh oh. What are you, uh -oh. What are you saying uh oh for? Yeah, your, your voice. Your, your voice. I think you're okay. Oh. I think you're okay. Okay. Uh, there was a movie called Yellow Jacket, and um, of course, Henry Fonda got the yellow fever in um, uh, Jezebel uh, with uh, Betty Davis, and she saves him, or she cares for him on that island. Um, at Just the end of the way movie. Of saying you don't know the answer, David. Well, I'm stalling for time. <laughs> <laughs> Linus, I, 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 You're gonna I, try not, to whiz us with all your facts. It's so. not Linus calling, uh, <laughs> but that's the only name that comes to mind. Uh, this uh, a, a pioneering doctor. I, I can't think of it. Linus Pauling. Is that your final answer? It'll have to be. Well, I'm afraid that answer was appalling, David Sheward. That uh, is not. The correct answer, I'm afraid. So we have and the a movie. Uh, David, for your information, the movie was Yellow Jack, not Yellow Jacket. Oh, okay. Oh. It wasn't okay. Yellow Jacket. How can that no. be? Uh, okay, that's a uh, little uh, bee uh, joke. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, I get it. Condon, David Condon. paid me five dollars to say that so he could have that line. That, that's oh, okay. So Connie, um, I, I rolled a number four. So. Yeah. I know for Googling. I, I don't know what you're doing over there on there. Yeah, I am. I'm trying to because I no. was thinking, I because you know who um, Jonathan Bolt wrote a play called Two Libra, which oh. I saw. That's Robert Bolt. And Robert, yeah. That's not the. Uh, but you're so, not allowed to look anything yeah, up on Google. You can't, like, Google. I, yeah, I can't answer. I can't answer the question because his name turned up. Um, oh, so, for being honest, be disqualified. Yeah. Be qualified. Yeah. Disqualified. yeah. I'm disqualified. sorry. I'm sorry, Connie. So Leslie, Leslie, fair, fair cop. And thank. By the way, thanks for your honesty, Connie. But yeah, mm -hmm. if you start googling things during it's a quiz, it's true you can't do it. But I just couldn't. Uh, I couldn't wait. Well, uh, Leslie, uh, do you know the answer? I'll read the question. I think if you had mentioned that he was also, I think if I'm right on this, you, if you had said that he also had a hospital named after him. I think it was Walter Reed. Wow. But you oh. said but Yellow Jack, I think, had to do with somebody named John. So I'm really confused myself. My first impulse was Walter Reed, so I'm going to stick with that. I may be wrong. I okay. Think. Is that your final answer? Yeah, that? yeah. I, I'm confused about I thinking about somebody named John, but I don't. John, I don't know. Go ahead, Walter Reed. Well, you are certainly literate, Leslie Hoban Blake, because you know how to read. That is the correct answer. Well done. It oh was my God! What? Well, Google said it was a Japanese immunolo immunologist named Hideo uh, something or other, and so. Uh, the Google was wrong. <laughs> the Japanese bacteriologist yeah. Hideo Noguchi led investigations for the Rockefeller Foundation, and that resulted in a vaccine based on his theory that disease was caused by leptospiral bacterium. No, you're not and... looking at yellow fever. That's not yellow fever that you're oh, looking not. at. Okay, thank you. <laughs> this is why we can't trust you. Oh, anyway. It, it was yeah. many years before the Rockefeller Foundation. It was in the, it was in the, the 20s, maybe? Or the teens, oh, okay. even. Okay, so now when I hear Walter Reed, I also think course, something yeah. positive instead of like, oh my God, oh my God, people are really sick, you know. Yeah. So, all right, thank you. Well, he did get a lot of credit for research by other people and sort of they all la landed it on him yeah. as, as well. well. Connie, Connie, you got to put the phone away. We can't play with the phone out. That doesn't okay, work. Okay, the phone is the phone is away. Okay. Thank but, you. but hey, Connie was really honest about saying that she was Googling and, and whatever. So, so really yeah, appreciate I honestly that. didn't think I had a, a chance in hell of knowing the answer. So, well, right now we have a four to two game. Leslie with four points, David with two, Connie not yet on the board. But we move into round two of the Today Yesterday quiz with more questions. And this one, Leslie, you can really go to town on this because you get this question. Are you ready? Sure. There we go. It's a multiple choice. The year 1925. Released today is Charlie Chaplin's classic film, The Gold Rush. It made a million dollars for United Artists and two million dollars for Chaplin. 
Speaking of wealth, which is not true about gold. Is it? <laughs> I don't like gold forever. Yeah. Is it A, the word carrot derives from the weight of a carob seed. B, gold is the only metal that isn't white. C, some Australian eucalyptus trees have gold in their leaves and branches. Or D, the Incas refer to gold as the sweat of the sun. Oh, interesting. Wow. One more what time with the answers, David. True. One more time with A to D, please. Absolutely sure. Which of these is not true about gold? A, the word carrot derives from the weight of a carob seed. B, gold is the only metal that isn't white. C, some Australian eucalyptus trees have gold in their leaves and branches. Or D, the Incas referred to gold as, quote, the sweat of the sun. Oops. Oops, we've lost Connie. But this is, this is Leslie's question anyway, so. I don't even have anything clever to say or, or even anything that brings up any memories on this one. I mean, I have a gold hand and a silver hand, but that's, oh you know, wow. that's that's all I have. Um, <clears throat> I don't know anything I guess about that shows your metal. Uh, I think the sweat of the Incas, uh, the sweat of the gods sounds like something the Incas would say. Because um, I knew the Incas very well. They live next door to the Mayans. Um, uh, I know, I'm sorry. Thank and we're you. all Inca staying wretches, so there you go. Right. Oh, right. Yeah. Is she coming back or is she staying away? I, I assume she got knocked off and she's going to try and oh. reload. Uh, so, uh, and, yeah. well, that's because she was using her phone. That's why she got knocked off. Um, I'm going to go with the... It's. I think it's easy. Hmm. I'm going to say that it's not at the carrot and the carob seed. I don't think that's it. So you're saying that, that is carob. That is C A R O B seed, right? right. Words, yeah, no, I don't believe that's true. Don't believe that carrot and carob are connected. No. Well. You will not be taking a vacation in the Caribbean, Leslie Hoban, uh, because that actually, weirdly enough, that is a true thing. That is that is incorrect. Okay. So since Connie's not here and I'm hopefully logging back on, uh, this kind of automatically goes to you. It's it's okay. But David, should so, we want to try and steal? Sure. Which of these? So which of these is not true? Go ahead. Not true. Is it? Uh, gold is the only metal that isn't. <clears throat> excuse me. Isn't white. Uh, see, some Australian eucalyptus trees have gold in their leaves and branches, or um, D, the Incas refer to gold as the sweat of the sun. Huh. I tend to, well, the eucalyptus thing sounds weird enough to be true. Uh, and that leaves the, uh, the sweat of the sun and uh, what was the, the other one? Um, there's the sweat of the sun and uh, gold the is the only metal that isn't white. But I thought gold. Oh, 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 okay. Yeah, gold is gold. So the question is. Welcome back, are Connie. Other metals, are other I'm metals? Here. Are other I'm metals? Here. Right. Uh, are other metals? Um, yeah. So. So if this is not true. Then there are other metals that aren't that aren't white. Right. Mm -hmm. or, I'm gonna or the go metals of color, if you if you prefer. Yes. <laughs> oh wait, wait, wait. So uh, the the statement is. Gold is the only metal that isn't white. Right. I think that is not true. I think other metals are white. Oh, wait, is that? Wait, you think other metals, other metals aren't white? Other metals aren't, other metals aren't white. Yeah. Is that your final answer? Yes. Well, although it's not correct to, politically correct to say this, uh, in this case, white is right, ladies and gentlemen. David Sure, you get those two points. The thing is, okay. there are two, there are only two metals. There's cesium oh. and copper are the other two oh. metals that are not. All other metals happen to be white. It's, it's a, oh, really? Yeah. So Interesting. So well done. And yes, the Incas did refer. They either said the sweat of the sun or the tears of the sun. They had all different uh, things for, went, for gold. How poetic. Yeah. And so we're now tied, are we, David and I? 
You are indeed. It's 4-4. Four, four. we got a 4-4 four, four time. Welcome back, Connie. Nice to see you. Oh, thank you. Oh, hey, look. Oh, I got clever a... girl. Yeah. That's so smart. It's, yes. It's, right. it's Ron. I Ron guess Connie's taking umbrage because she has I'm umbrage. taking umbrage, and this is Betty's umbrella. It's a very <laughs> fine one, too. Thank you, Betty. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Thanks for coming back. We really appreciate it. It's great to have you. In the neighborhood, playing the game. We so went to, right past you in the last question, but that's okay. We didn't know what what happened, how long it would take you. David did get a shot at getting the uh, question, uh, and he got it right. So we have. And I missed four. it. So there you go. So there you go. But the next question does go directly to you. You came back perfect timing, <laughs> Connie. Um, this question is for you. It's a non-multiple choice question. Again, we're doing everything that happened on June 26th in history. This yeah. one happened on ni in 1929. Born today, born today in the Bronx is this <laughs> graphic designer who would go on to create such imagery as Bob Dylan's psychedelic poster and the I Love New York logo. He would Easy, also Milton, Milton Glasser. Uh, is that your... Final answer. Yes. Yes. Break the glass, ladies and gentlemen. Connie Thank you. On the board. I was going to say he also co-founded New York Magazine with uh, Clay Felton. You don't need to say I'm any of that to, stuff. Okay. I, I, uh, I'm a big fan. I mean, he's no longer with us, but I was a big fan of his. And I saw a documentary on him and... Oh. I'm sorry he's gone. He had a really interesting life. Uh, he only his, passed away a couple of years, a year ago. I know. It really yeah. is. Um, and he was a wonderful artist. He did this very nice kind of drawing painting of his daughter in bed asleep and the cat curled up on top. And the cat was named Mr. Hoffman because she thought he was the greatest actor of all time. So I don't agree, but I think he's a damn fine actor, but I just love that. You know? Are we talking Dustin or Philip Seymour? Oh, right. Wait. No, yeah, I'm, I'm fortunate. I mean, fortunate. I don't know. Any, I'm mad at Philip Seymour Hoffman. I'm just, he broke my heart. Okay. So uh, enough can't. said well, yeah, about yeah. that. Um, yeah. yeah, no, it was Dustin. Dustin Hoffman. Hmm. Well, I'm walking here. I'm walking here. I, I can do that. Can. Did you ever get to say that on the street? I actually hit a cab fender and yelled that at the driver. And people on the sidewalk went like this. It was uh, for you. I was yeah. very angry because he he, he got so close to me before he, before he stopped. I was... My you know, oh, something else that really happens. I, I don't think in terms of I'm walking here. That another word flies out of my mouth before anything else. No, no, well, no, 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 no. Uh, it, it just came out like that. It wasn't thought of. It just happened. The other half of the odd couple did that, and he hit the top of the cab, and he said, I'm walking here. And that man, that actor, very fine actor's name, is not in my head. Jack Tony Klugman. Tony Randall and Klugman, Jack Klugman. Jack Klugman. Jack Klugman, Jack yeah. Klugman. yeah. Loved him. Yeah. All right. We have a, a really great game right now. We've got uh, Leslie and David tied with four, Connie with two points. But here's the deal. Um, we have one more question that goes directly to David Sheward. So, David, you can break okay. the tie if you get right. this correct. The year was 1948. Okay. Published, speaking of the New York, well, that, that was New York Magazine was the other one. This is The New Yorker. Published in The New Yorker today is this short story, all about a small town whose residents have an annual habit of throwing stones. For one point, name the story, and for the second, the author, who got a lot of hate mail for writing it. It was, well, I'm teach as, uh, it's, I got, I'm glad I got this question because this is a story that we teach in the ninth grade. Uh, yep. And I've, done, I've taught it a couple of times and it is The Lottery by Shirley Jackson. Is that your final answer? Yes. You win the million dollar sweepstakes. Yes, of course, that is The Lottery by Shirley Jackson. Well, see, this That's is a heavy we... piece. How, how old are ninth graders these days? Uh, I think they're 13, aren't they? 13 and 14. That's yeah, it's a great story. I, I read it. That's a reasonably, it at, you know, fine point. I, I mean, that 
must write, raise some interesting questions. Yeah, and it's a lot of the 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 uh, teaching is like you know foreshadowing and uh, mm -hmm. unexpected and irony. Oh, I see. I see. And uh, you, not you don't the point of the story. Not the point of the story, which too. is what happens in America every day. Okay. <laughs> oh, and that too. And that too. But I, you're teaching okay. also. I wonder. For, for, a lot of you want what you want to teach is writing strategies, like how does the gotcha. author convey her points, and uh, so then you go in, you get into, you know, uh, were you surprised by the ending? What do you think the ending means? Mm -hmm. You know, etc. Well, this generation of students it just means, hey, let's go get stoned. So there you go. <laughs> you know, actually, that's not true. They're kind of, um, at least my students were. You know, smoking weed is legal and kind of like something you do daily. They, they're into other drugs that scare me. But, um, do you, well, as a teacher, do you, or do you feel compelled to say, don't do that? Or do you just kind of, when they're in your class, you, you just concentrate on that? And, and myself or Connie? I'm actually, I'll ask both of you. I was, I was talking to Connie, but she, she deals with college kids. You've got high school yeah. kids, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I, it's like, you know, I try, I just, you know, I say, do not do this in school. You know, what you do on your own time is up to you. It's just not a good idea to abuse it. But that's not, that's the, a counselor's job, not my job. Fair enough. I mean, I try to say I wouldn't, it's not a good idea, but I, I don't push it too much. Yeah, I would say that about murder to my kids. <laughs> <laughs> you want to do that after school? Don't kill anybody. Don't kill anybody. Yeah, use a good knife if you're using knife. Yeah, it's, but uh, so serrated because it gets the job done quicker. But anywho, we have we are coming to the end of the third round. We have the end of the the second round. Excuse me, second round of the today yesterday quiz on this episode of Dave's Gone By. We're here, by the way, with David Sheward, Leslie Hoban Blake, and Connie Congdon. It's just about 11.30, and, and I'm Dave Lefkowitz, by the way. So here's the deal. We have a great game going. We have David Sheward with six points, Leslie Hoban Blake with four points, and Connie Congdon on the board with two. As we Finally. Go to the side. Well, you're on there. Connie, I say yeah. that every week. Um, I tell all the new guests, all the new players, that just to get on the board in this crazy game is, you know, worth applause, is like congratulations. Winning is a whole other thing in, in, in this nutso game, but just the very fact that you've gotten two points. You should, you should actually be pr much more proud than getting the play in, in the Red Bull Festival. Uh, more proud I am. For AC David, I am very proud. I'm very proud. I'm very moved. Oh, you know, I've worked hard for this moment, and uh, is there anybody is that so, Is that the speech you pull out for all your awards, Connie? Is that the one? Yes, I do. I say, you know, thank you. And uh, the thing is, just to go back very quickly to the drug thing, I tell my students that I I am a sober woman. I've been sober for twenty six years now, and I just give them a little speech about what I tried before I had to give it all up. And I'm just very honest about wow. drug use. And if, uh, if a student is stoned and I know it, I'll, well, I'll just ask them, are you stoned? Yeah, so go back to your dorm. Yeah, because wow. I, I don't know what you're experiencing here, but it's, I, I need sober people in the room. And that's, that's it when it happens. Uh, there have been a couple of times where I knew it and I didn't do it because I felt the student was impossible anyway or very fragile. So I also give my remedy for hangovers. I taught 8.30 a.m. classes, oh, yeah. so I needed to do something about that. Okay, now, all right, let's, let's go on. Shall we uh, go Connie, on? Connie, a quick question. How did the rest of the class respond when you said that? The class was very, very supportive. Um, of you or of the student? Of, 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 well, one big, I'm not an authority figure, let me put it that way, except when I, you know, have to be. So how did the others, they were, I, they were appreciative. And then I actually had a couple of students come back to me in the 25 years I've taught and confessed that they thought they were having trouble with the, uh, 
it's usually alcohol. Alcohol's the big uh, troublemaker. So, mm -hmm. not some, yeah. You who I would just uh, you know I tank up on that on like five gallons of chocolate you who before every class and. Um, <laughs> You can tell the yeah. sugar just coursing through me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I made it through the class, but just barely. Anywho, yeah. anywho, yeah, that thing that just fell flat. Um, that won't be going into my next play. But here's the deal. Let's begin. Okay, boo -boo. <laughs> Let's begin round three of our today yesterday game. Remember, every one of these questions are things that happen on June twenty sixth. David, I thought you said let lesbian. I thought you said lesbian hard game. That you said, let's uh, begin. It took me that long to get it. Lesbian. Watching that. I like that. Yeah. Lesbian. I thought that's what he said. I thought he was starting a whole new topic Lesbian. there. Lesbian. Yeah. Okay, I like that. That's, Just wrote it down. Definitely bigger than this game. All right, but here we go. Right. Okay. We're gonna, right. Leslie, by the way, you get a chance to tie the game here. If you... Yes, I, do. I, I, I get a chance. You let's do. see what my chance is, David. <laughs> Uh, it's a multiple choice. Yeah, thanks a lot, David. <laughs> a little editorializing there. Okay, go ahead. The year 1974. At Marsh Supermarket in Troy, Ohio, the very first barcode scanner was used to check out an item. It cost 67 cents. Was it A, Aunt Jemima maple syrup, B, juicy fruit gum, C, Ritz crackers, D, Swanson frozen peas. Do we jump in or no? This is your question. No, no, nobody jumps in. No, you stay where Just you question. are. Stay where you are. Uh, Stand uh. down. Um, Aunt Jemima pancake syrup, juicy fruit gum, something I can't remember. Ritz crackers. Ritz crackers and frozen peas. For 67 cents. Our gum did not cost 67 cents in 1974. Not even in Ohio. Do, so that's not second, it. Do we win a uh, car if we get it right? Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, I'll read the question again. At the supermarket in Ohio, the very first barcode. It doesn't matter yeah. about the beginning of the question. The answers are all that matter. All right. It's oh, boy. Wait, why are you reading it for him? It's for me. Let, he can wait. <laughs> Excuse oh. me. I'm trying to think here. I'm thinking <laughs> here. Ooh, I'm, I'm thinking, thinking here. here. I'm thinking Sha, here. Sha. <laughs> Just Sha. Okay, as my grandmother would say. All right, now. Um, I'm not bothering you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, God. All right. So I, I, I was on a train there, and now I'm on a track. I, I'm, I'm lost. Sorry, um, sorry I said that. Juicy Fruit Gum didn't, I said Juicy Fruit Gum did not cost 67 cents in 1974. There are too many numbers in there. Um, I don't remember if Aunt Jemima made pancake syrup. Probably, but I don't remember ever using it. Peas. Peas and... Okay, so the last one that I'm missing. Peas, juicy fruit, Aunt Jemima, and what? Ritz crackers. Ritz crackers. I'm going to say... You know, in the dim, dark days of the 70s, I can't remember what anything cost anymore. Um, Oh, now we lost David. He uh, went he to go to oh, no, I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm still oh, here. Okay. All right. I'm still um, here. Okay. I'll go with pieces were cheap. Um crackers. All that stuff is cheap stuff. I'm gonna need an answer, Les. I know, I know, I know, I know. And I keep Forgetting the one thing I got, I still have the same thing. Peas, I'll read them one more fruit, time. Uh, all the choices are Aunt Jemima maple syrup, oh my juicy God. fruit gum, Ritz what crackers, Swanson frozen peas. Okay, I'm going to say Aunt Jemima maple syrup because I'm sure that she never had maple syrup. There might have been Aunt Jemima pancake syrup, but there never would have been Aunt Jemima maple syrup because that's expensive. Or the, I'm sorry, I'm, you know what, Leslie, we'll call it pancake. Aunt Jemima syrup. That's not fair if, if you oh, did it wasn't maple syrup. syrup. That I'm was my sorry. clue. All That's right. almost syrup, okay? Yeah. As we know, it's all corn syrup. Syrup, Ritz crackers, peas. Okay. <laughs> I think I can't remember. What? Oh, the juicy <laughs> word gum. I knew that the first time around. 
All right. Um, num, 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 it's num, still num. Saturday morning here, ladies and gentlemen. We're doing the day's gone by. <laughs> and it will be for a long time. Uh, okay. Uh, we'll go with the, I'll still go with the Aunt Jemima. I know you were trying to help me there, but I, I don't think that's, I, I'm going to go with Aunt Jemima. Well, speaking of, not only is Aunt Jemima now politically incorrect, but that was an incorrect answer as well. So we get to roll the die and see, wait, no, that's from my Facebook page. Where's my roll the die page? Hold on. I love Connie gets it because I think Connie knows the answer. So, you know. We will see. Mm -hmm. the, the number comes up though uh, for David, because it's a number two that came up and David is number three. Okay. So he's closer All right. to the two. David, this All question right. is yours. So the question is, which of these three remaining items here on the Price is Right is worth a dollar sixty-seven? No, no, no. Is is? Sixty-seven cents. It was uh -huh. scanned in 1974 at March Supermarket in Troy, Ohio. Okay. So which of these three remaining? And because today was the day we had the first barcode. Correct. Okay. And 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 one uh, of these was, was scanned and read okay. sixty-seven cents. It worked. Yeah. And uh, uh, George H. W. Bush didn't know what it was when that famous time that he went out in public, okay, uh, and went to a grocery par a market just like a real person. Okay, so our choices are Ritz crackers, uh, frozen peas, and what was the other one? Juicy fruit gum. <laughs> okay, all right. I think juicy fruit. I think Leslie's right. Juicy fruit gum would not have been as much as sixty-seven cents in nineteen seventy-four. The, so the frozen peas or the um, Ritz crackers? Um, hmm, I would think Ritz crackers would be, they either, uh, I think they would both be more than 67 cents. Uh, so Bob Barker, if I don't get it right, do I still get the car? Uh, let's In the see. wheel. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say uh, uh, the frozen peas. Is that your final answer? Yes, I, I, yes, sure. Well, put on your undergarments and take a pee. That is not the correct answer, David Schwartz. So Connie Congdon, yes, you're, you're, I see her, you're like, oh my God, I get to steal this question. So Connie, it's, it's a 50-50 yeah. for you. Which of these was scanned for 67 cents back in 1974? Was uh, I, I'm going to go, I, I'm sure it's Ritz crackers, but I'm going to go with the Juicy Fruit Gum. Is that your final answer? <sighs> yes. Well, as we discussed earlier, Connie, I happen to be Chew-ish. Little, little gum joke. <laughs> Connie, you're right. It was uh, not right. <laughs> Yeah. Awesome. I say okay. that it was one little pack. It might have been, it could have been like a, one of these five. Oh, 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 well. Yeah, just a single that. pack. I think was, because, you know, a single pack is gone like it's a dollar oh, or yeah. something now. now. Oh, yeah. It could have been 50 cents then. Yeah. yeah, but Juicy Fruit, okay. Good, so, good. Sorry, I let you David. Straight, David, not really. <laughs> well, here's the deal. What sorry, a game. Not sorry. This is the second week in a row when we've really got a, a serious game going because David Shure has six points, but Leslie and Connie are both tied with four. Whoa! What can Whoa. you feel? The, the it's, well, it's very exciting to be tied with such a <laughs> champion, you know. I'm really, I, I, you know, and I barely trained, so I, I just... <laughs> It's pure oh, luck, no. Leslie. Just, you oh, know, really. Tra training is putting your head under a pillow and going like this. That's training. For this, you know? <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Here's the deal, though. We still have a couple more questions to go. So it's any. it really is anybody's game. And the next question, however, goes directly to David Schuer. So, oh, okay. Connie. It goes to Connie next. Connie, it goes to Connie. I'm sorry. It goes to Con Connie. Miss well, I'm, I'm behind you, girl. I got your back, you back, girl. You're Thank welcome. you. Thank you, Leslie. Here's the You're deal. Welcome. See, I get confused with that because when I first put down what numbers you chose, I have them in, a, in an order that you get them. And then when you choose what order you get, that doesn't matter. Do anyway. you think we care? Do you think we care, David? <laughs> yeah, we, we really don't care we about care? No. The year 1977, Connie. Okay. Describing this event, 
a reporter for the Indianapolis Star wrote, quote, men in leisure suits, women with permanents, and teens and sub-teens in dungarees descended 18,000 strong on Market Square Arena last night, clutching tickets purchased two months ago for up to $15 a piece, even higher among scalpers, unquote. For one point, whom were they there to see? And for the second point, why only two months later did the night become historic? Well, that was in uh, Cincinnati, and the band, God damn it, uh, Tommy, what's his name, was in it. And the, the crowd heard them warming up, thinking the concert had started. There was only one door open, and there was this huge stampede, and a lot of people got killed. It's just awful. And the band... Who was Tommy? No. He was. Uh, uh, I, I'm going to say Iron Maiden. Is that your so the band, uh, or, or they were there to see Iron Maiden, and it was historic because it was. It was a huge stampede. It's I, you know it's probably not Iron Maiden. So I'm going to change and say Pink Floyd. Uh, is that your final answer? And my final answer, David. Well, you look great, Connie, but you're not exactly in the pink. I'm afraid you don't get any points for that answer. We're going to have some, some rolling, which, which means incorrect. So we're going to roll the die, ladies and gentlemen, and it comes back to four. So four is, well, Connie, but it's closer to David just a bit. So, David, okay. you get to try and answer Excuse this question. Me. Four is exactly between two and six. How is it closer to David? So David, is, David is three. Oh, I'm sorry. I beg your pardon. I'm sorry, David. I thought you were two. No, Forgive me. No. So that they were both, the, the answers, both of them were wrong. It wasn't. Both of those answers point. were incorrect. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, but so they sounded happened. so good, Connie. They really did. So, you should write a play Something about happened <laughs> at yeah. this concert in 1977. And it became, fa and what, so. And the, it became, the oh, I, I know what it is. I know what it is now. Well, Damn don't it. Say, don't say. <laughs> So it's right, something right. that happened in 1977 to this band. So you want the name of the band that appeared and what happened? That was well, for one point. I, I will let me read this question and listen very carefully. For okay. one point, whom were the crowds there to see? And for the All second right. point, why only two months later did the night become historic? It was Lin Manuel Noriega, uh, Hamilton. Hamilton. Hamilton was created. No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so 1970, and did you say where it yes, happened? Market Square, where a reporter was writing about it for the Indianapolis Star. Okay. Oh, Indianapolis, that's not Cincinnati at all. Uh, I'm going to say 1977. Well, I was alive then, so I should know what this is. Uh, all right, and uh, something happened with this band, and then something happened two months later. Oh. Was it Phil Collins, and then two months later he was starving or something, and he fainted, and the later they found out something bad, or was it Rod Stewart that that happened to? <laughs> um, oh. I think or Rod, Rod Stewart fainted on the stage, and then two months later it came out that he hadn't had anything to eat in like the past two weeks, and he was stoned, getting back to what we were talking about, and he had too much of a certain substance in his body, which I won't repeat. All right, I'll say Rod Stewart. And uh, it, they, it, it came to pass that uh, he collapsed from hunger because he hadn't been eating and he only had something else in his body of a sexual nature. Wait, whoa, wait, all right. What? Why? Yeah, okay, <laughs> I, 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 I kind of, yeah. What do you mean something, uh, what else would you have? I, I thought like it'd be a drug of some, what the hell? I, I, I'm throwing the game away this moment. Oh, wait, Rod Stewart? Rod Stewart? Or somebody. Maybe it was Phil Collins. I don't remember. <laughs> All right. Is that your final answer? I source of protein, I've been told. Yeah, yes. You know what? Forget the second part because I do look, look it up on Google later after this. Yeah, no, I, Rod Stewart? I'm very confused. I mean, maybe, Collins. maybe Rachel I Hunter. Dave, like, Dave Leftwich is ready to go break all his Rod Stewart why, records why, right why, now. No, there's nothing wrong with it. 
Yeah. But I think his voice is like that. Um, well, from the, your reaction about Rod Stewart, well, I don't no. know. Okay, no. <laughs> Rod's, I'll say Rod Stewart, and it turned out he ha he took a drug overdose. I'll, well, I'll, okay, I'll, okay. Uh, Rod Stewart overdosed drugs. Yeah, no, it's yeah. just that, that kind of, I've never heard that about Rod Stewart, that it would have been. Uh, I heard it about somebody. I mean, I mean, he was as heterosexual as that gets. I've never heard no. anything beyond that. Anyway, um, no points on that. None, zero, okay. not, not even remotely any points. Okay. <laughs> With somebody, <laughs> Leslie Hall and Blake, um, David Short did not gonna do a good job on that question, <laughs> or, or he did not David do a good job on that question. Job so on that question. You had a meltdown. David did fine. I don't know. I never saw such a meltdown. Um, you want to say David? You want to say Rod Stewart again in that voice? I loved it. I Other want to, get to swallow, that. But yeah. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Um, Again, I say what I said before. It's a, it's supposed to be a very good source of protein. So oh, no, that's not, what I, I was always told. Oh, God. That's um, what I was always told. Yep. Yes, that's what we were always told, right? <laughs> anyway, getting anyway. back to um, the, the yeah. place. I know the year. I know the instance. What was the place again? It was uh, according to the. It was written about in the Indianapolis Star, Market Square Arena. Um, that doesn't Men mean in major I'm, I'm going to make a guess given the time that it happened. Okay, that well, I'm still, as soon as I'm finished. It was the Rolling Stones and that it was Keith Richards and he had a heart attack. So they had to reschedule the, 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 the that's it. Is and that I'm making that up. I have no idea. Well, I guess you've got no expectations of getting that particular question correct, uh, Leslie Obama. But no, I, I guess I fooled all of you. All those people, of young and old, turned out to see Elvis. Oh. And what turned out to be two months later, that was his last and live. Then, oh. Oh, oh, my God. I never even thought of Elvis. Wow. Okay. That, that was, was old, bad Elvis. Oh, oh. Yeah. When oh. they did stamps of Elvis. I was so disgusted that they did old fat Elvis. They should have just done young, young hunky Elvis. Well, they old like Elvis the stamps stamps. Stamps. Okay. And have you seen really August really Wilson's stuff. stamps? August Wilson's stamps are beautiful. Yes. He looks beautiful. It's they're just beautiful. They're out now. I bought a lot. So Pops, cool. since did we meet up at the O'Neill when 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 August was there? I'm sure because uh, I would always come and see his plays, whatever they in were. In the 90s, somewhere on 91 to 94, would you, would you have been around there? Oh, absolutely. Okay, because yeah. I was there I was there two years in a row up there, so that would probably have been when. So, I mean, I know, uh, what, I, aside from anything else, I'm pretty sure that's when we met. Go ahead. Okay, hello again. Hello. Hello again. Hello. But you were August jog of my memory when you said that because that's where, you know. That's, that's For a while, kind of we might have met there too because I was out, up at the O'Neill the same kind of time period. Uh, well, you and I met at the O'Neill, David, yeah. Yeah. right. Yeah. So, but, Connie, do you live in Connecticut? No, I live in Massachusetts. Oh. Yeah. She lives in Amherst. It's not Amherst. Oh, that's right, she does. It's okay. Amherst. I knew and that. the H is forgot. silent. Yeah. Yay. I okay. Amherst. Anyway. I know, I used to date a guy who went to Amherst. He was very big on the silent H, yes. Yes, we're very happy to Amherst. have Amherst. Tiny, tiny Happy tiny. to Avis ear. Uh, so I moved to Hadley, though. I just this is my friend Betty's house. I moved to Hadley uh, because Adley or Adley? Yeah. What, honey? <laughs> Is it Adley or Adley? At, there we use the fucking age, okay? Hadley. Sometimes people it's call the it fucking the fucking H, dear. It's the fucking H. Is <laughs> the H. And uh, you know we call it the Republic of Hadley. Oh. Because uh -huh. it's not completely within the tofu curtain. So, uh, oh, so is that a anyway. crunchy granola esque kind of area of Massachusetts, like everybody's health food? Type? Well, all, you know, it's it, it, unless you go to, you know, this visit Southeast or so, there's a lot of Massachusetts that's not crunchy granola. Uh, yeah, and, I, I, and, I David, I think David, you're being pulled away. Can you can you hang with us to finish the game for like five or ten? Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I need to go by twelve though. Okay. Let, let, let's let's make sure we finish the today yesterday okay. game with our gang. So okay. 
So and we have a game that is still David with six points, Leslie with four points, Connie with two points, oh, with four points, excuse me. So we still have a very close game that anybody could take. However, David, you could really, uh, you know, you could finish it okay. off by getting this question. Last question. Well, the last of our round. Plug my stuff. Right. I'm back. I'm back on. Thank you. Plug okay. okay. <laughs> right. David Shore. Nine minutes. Pick it up. Pick it up. David Shore. The, yeah. the, the year was 1990. Okay. Yes. Multiple choice. Radio stations throughout Canada and the Midwest began banning the music of K.D. Lang, not because of politics or sexuality, but owing to her prominent objection to the beef industry. Which oh. of these is not a K.D. Lang song? Okay. A, The Last Cigarette Waltz, B, Kundalini Yoga Waltz, C, Watch Your Step Polka, D, Don't Be a Lemming Polka. One of these is not a Katie Lang song. Don't Be a Lemming Polka. Here, here. I think you're right. Is that your final answer? Yeah, it's probably Do Be a Lemming Polka. Well, I'm afraid you went right over the cliff with that one, David Sheward. That is not the correct answer. That is oh, actually damn it. a Katie Lang So, Well, no, don't go. Damn it. This, 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 uh, what you Good might for you guys. You get this deal. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm rooting for David now. I don't know. He He's a public school teacher. and you know. <laughs> well, I was a public school teacher. What is well, David, you're rooting for David? Pressure. Where's my feminist friend here now? Huh? Oh, see, oh, there. I'm getting David. it again. Getting it again. <laughs> Okay. Ahead, I'm sorry. Leslie, um, Too much collectivism. I rolled a six, which means that. Whoa! Well, that means I get it right. Well, well if you get it right, you do. You can tie the game. But so, I don't know the answer. So run through the questions. I'll, I'll read them again. Run through the answers that are left. Just which one is yes, not a Katie yes, Lang song? Which of these not that are left? Song. A. The last, last cigarette. Waltz. Uh, B. Kundalini yoga waltz. C. Watch your step polka. I want it to be the Kundalini yoga thing so much because it's so not in my head. That's so not Katie Lang. I'm going to go with Kundalini yoga. Is that your final answer? That's as close as I can come in my head. Yes. Well, the answer is a bit of a stretch. I'm afraid it is not correct. And so Connie, Connie, all yours, you know, Connie. for David Sheward, you have the oh, chance boy. to steal this question. Okay. Which one is not a Katie Lang song? Is it the last cigarette waltz or the watch your step polka? The watch your step polka. Is that your final answer? It is. Well, uh, oh, I, I, I'm, I'm blanking on a pun. I'm sorry. Uh, well, Dots all for that question, which all of you got wrong. The the fake one was the last, last cigarette waltz. waltz. I made that one up. All the rest are Kagan Lang songs. Two of them, to be honest, were on the soundtrack to even Cowgirls Get the Blues, which is why they had such a good oh. um, Was that oh. the only waltz in there? Well, um, well, Kundalini Yoga Waltz was actually in the oh, okay. soundtrack, apparently. And, and one of those polkas, I think, was there. The Lemming... One of the polkas was on one of her regular albums. So okay. the two polkas were real. Uh, only one of the waltzes was real. So we still have, um, honestly, you're not going to believe this. The champion remains champion. We're going to do the tiebreaker anyway. But David Sheward, with six points at the end of round three, is has retained, you know, has gotten the crown back. From Vicky yeah. Fogging last week. David Shore, congratulations. And you look fabulous in that crown. <laughs> doesn't he, doesn't he? So we have enough time, though, uh, David, I hope that we can do the tiebreaker anyway. It's all for fun. Um, okay. What we do, um, um, Connie, is that I read the question, I'll read it again, and then I'll, I'll, you'll write it down. You'll write down the answer. I'll give a three, two, one, and then everybody shows their answer to the camera at the same time. Oh, oh, I have to pick up my piece of paper. Uh, 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 all right, it's okay. Right. It's okay. We I can do it. We have four minutes before David has to run out of the room. Here we go. Okay. Here's the question. Again, it's still, it's June 26th, 2018. Unveiled today by West Japan Railway, 
is its new bullet train running from Hakata to Osaka. Journalists everywhere called it the cutest or most kawaii bullet train because it's decorated inside and out with what theme? That's a tough one for me. That's what right. theme? Okay. Can you still uh, okay. hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. We'll see you in okay. here. I've yes. been kicked off for some reason. So no, before didn't. everybody, when you show theirs, because I cannot see you, when you show theirs, let me call out my answer, okay? Is that okay with you guys? Yeah, sure. 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 I'm right. ready. I can't see I'll you. I swear again. to God, I cannot see you. All right, thank you. We'll read the question. Oh, Does anybody have an answer this. yet? Or have you written it yeah, down? Yeah, I got it answered. Okay. I'll read the question one more time, and then I'll give a three, two, one. 2018 was the year unveiled today by West Japan Railway is its new bullet train running from Akata to Osaka. Journalists everywhere called it the cutest or most kawaii bullet train because it's decor decorated inside and out with what theme? Three, two, one. Don't say anything. I want to be able to, to, to answer. Well, don't you close your eyes, Leslie, because they're holding up the... Can't see I can't oh. see anything because I'm not on this. I'm not on... I got kicked off the site. Oh, I, I don't that. understand why. Well, you, three, two, one, Leslie. What's your answer? Hello, Kitty. Oh, and that's what I said. Well done to David Sheward. Well done to Leslie. Sorry, Connie. That was a great answer. It was not Pokemon. It was, in fact, hello. Hello, Kitty. Oh, boy. Yeah. Ooh. I'm sorry, guys. It was lovely playing with you. Nice to see you again, Constance. I'm so, I don't know why I got kicked off. It was something I said. Well, we Maybe. still hear you and see you. So, Leslie, remind us. Um, um, can we see you in Critic Circle with Charlie? What's what's the latest? You can, you can see me. That's amazing. I can't see any of you. There's nothing on, on my on screen. Uh, well, we can't actually see you, but tell us, do you have a new episode of Critic Circle? No, no, nothing, nothing new to report. I'm just, I, I, I've been taking everything slow and I, I, uh, probably will have something up, but not, there's nothing now. No problem. But they can see the older episodes at uh, the Critic Circle. Yes, YouTube. on YouTube. It's Critic Circle on YouTube or Two on the Isle on YouTube. Excellent. Now, David Sheward, also you, have you, very quickly, what have you written this past week that people can read? Uh, well, I posted something on the David desk where I wrote a, a mini, a little mini script, a little mini play about what if Samantha and Darren and Endora from Bewitched went to a family counseling session. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that. That's on the the David Desk blog, right? Just yes. look at David. Like whole... David, are there, David, if there are parts for each of us, can we play it next week? If you like, sure. There's I can Darren. With, you, with you is Darren. We'll, you yeah, do Darren. Darren, Samantha. There's Darren, Samantha, the therapist, and uh, uh, Endora. I'm Endora. Those are the four so people. Joyce can play the offstage voice of Endora. I can do Samantha. David can do the... The therapist and you can do uh, uh one of the two darren's and then i'm going to work i want to work on a satire of uh, sam shepherd and the flintstones called buried child in bedrock <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> I love it. Oh Which, because we never found out where bam bam came from you know this is true yeah. he was left on there on the rubble's doorstep and we don't know who his mother and father oh was. yeah yeah, sure. Just one friend. quick question on your bewitched thing. Who, which Darren are you talking about? Oh, that's right. Is it? it doesn't matter. Uh, is it Dick York or is it Darren. Dick Sargent? The first one Darren. of them was. One of them was gay, gay, gay. Dick York. Now, Dick Sargent. Dick Sargent, the second one. So, okay. Oh, yeah. oh so, and yeah. Also, I just want to say it's too bad we didn't have a question about Formica because of uh, Connie's play, The Tales of the Last Formicans. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Which Lost for Mikeans. But I thank you, dear. Play. Lost for Mikeans. Oh, my tales of the Lost for Mikeans, among love many other play. plays by Connie Condon. Connie, of course, of course, we're begging people to go to the Red Bull Theater Company's website and watch your play and mine, among a couple yes. of other one-act plays, on July twelfth, Monday night. 7.30. Uh, suggested donation starts at $25, but you can also pay nothing or pay what you can. Are you sending us a link or we just have to go there? 
It's the I just told you it's a Red Bull. Monday night. No, no, no. I know that. I didn't know if there was a, a direct link or not. I'm just asking. We put it on the Facebook page if you want to find it there. Joyce I'm not Facebook. on Facebook, Facebook for the nine thousandth time. So Red Bull <laughs> is seven twelve. Okay, I got it. Yeah. So, so, but here, here's the deal, Leslie. I'll I'll be emailing it to a whole bunch of people and tweeting it. Okay. Facebook. That's all I wondered. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But it's Monday. Well, it was nice book. talking with you. Bye, guys. Well, we, Bye, well, Leslie. Connie, Connie, just are are any of your other plays being done? Is there any other place that we can see your stuff? Right now, I I don't know. Okay. But my most recent plays uh, uh, are are Lips and Paradise Street. So they're out there. They, you know, I don't know until I get my little statement from my publisher. So, so Connie, what's your, your, you do have a website where people can go and read about you and that is? Yeah, you can, uh, you can, it's under construction and uh, it's uh, just look under, just look under Constance Congdon. Just the title of it was under construction. I like yeah, that. Yeah. Never Actually, you know what? That's a great title. It is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, guys, it has been. Oh, David, thank you. Thank you. And Connie, I'm sorry so I worthy, made... Connie, Connie, you were a worthy opponent. It was fun yes. playing with you. Thank you. Thank great. you. And David, great thank job. you. And and David uh, Lefkowitz, thank you for doing this. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you. Please come back and play the game again, Connie. We would love, love, love to have you. Okay. Um, and and okay. just keep writing the plays and looking forward to seeing your work on July 12th. Guys, have a great, great week, and we'll see you. Okay, soon. dear. You too. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Just... Well, I'm Mary Poppins. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. It's just afternoon. On this Saturday, June 26, 2021, you're watching the Dave's Gone by Facebook. Yo, what bit? What bit? Uh, Stan posted a rather uh, risque. <laughs> Did you see it? Yeah, I, I could glance at it. Did he change the face or did he, he just. Put your face on. I don't know how he does it. It's your face. Yes. Look at that. That's your face. Can I hold that up to. Um... No, because I can't open oh, my... it. It no. won't let me open it. If you can open it, it's basically. Did he post it on my Facebook? I, well, yeah, I can't really share it. He commented on your uh, Dave's gone by on your on your. Can you see? On oh, my my uh, feed thing. You know, I'm not going to mess yeah. with it. I'll see it later. Well, basically, but basically, yeah. it's the statue David yeah. with your face wearing earphones, and then. Yeah, what well, you can say it out loud. I was talking about my. Yeah, you you can say the magical word. Uh, <laughs> hey, where is it? Oh, here it is. My special ointment scrotum only there it is scrotum only so yes it's a statue of david with an itchy red <laughs> oh i'm so proud oh my god i, I, I was yes. <laughs> yes thank you stan thank you really really and thank you of course to david and constance and uh, and to leslie what fun, what a delight and how how cool was connie so honest and so open and so smart too. This was really great. And congratulations to David for winning this week's today. I'm putting him in, in Cultural Daily. That's the only one. What's the other one that David has? Theaterlife.com, okay. culturaldaily.com, and his blog, oh. The David Desk. Oh, that's what I need. But it's not really a dot com. You have to check on that. It's like you have to find the blog called The David Desk. Um, so anyway. I'm also David, Dave Lefkowitz, and have been doing this program, Dave's Gone By, since October of 2002. This is our 804th episode of the show. We're live June 26, 2021. But let's say you wanted to go see episodes that we've done for the past 18 and a half years. You're like, okay, this, this episode was kind of fun. Let me see. You've had other playwrights on the program, which we have. People like Richard Nelson, and um, I was blank when I have to do this sort of thing. But who else? And Sheldon Harnick has been on the program, and uh, ooh, help me out. And, and the late Charles Grodin was on the show a few years ago. So we're very proud of that. And the archives are available for free to everyone at any time. Just go to davesgoneby.com, D-A-V-E-S-G-O-N-E-B-Y. Dot com. Now, be advised that, except, you know, up until four years ago, all our archives are audio only. 
or a radio show or like a podcast. It's only been the past couple of years that we've been doing video too. And I still think of this as a radio show. But it's all there at davesgongby.com. So you can go to our first episodes, our 10th, our 110th, our 610th. They're all there. Just, just surf. I mean, there's a search box, of course, if you're looking for a particular uh, guest that we've had. Or, you know, you want to see what we did back on Groundhog Day in our third year. Go to davesgoneby.com. We also post all our archives, both the interviews alone and the full episodes, at archive.org. That's a nonprofit website that's just collecting as much material from the history of the human race as it possibly can. Archive.org. All of our shows are there, and all of our interviews are there, too. And if you're an audio person, and you want to listen to the show, you don't have time to sit there and watch the show, but you want to be on the go and be at the gym or in the park listening, we, there's a, um, a podcasting platform called castbox.fm. Castbox.fm. We take the audio files and we put them there, all 18 and a half seasons of this, uh, at castbox.fm on our Dave's Gone By page. We have a Dave's Gone By YouTube page also that has gotten a little problematic because we used to play a lot of music on the show, music that we didn't have the rights to because everyone else on YouTube gets to play, gets to put on some video from MTV or use footage that is not theirs, but when we do it, oh, 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 you're blocked, you're banned, you're muted, and so forth. So YouTube is not really the best place to find the show, but you will find a lot of our stuff on YouTube. And finally, if you tune in, uh, if you live on Nassau County, and you get Altice Cable, Cable Vision, if people still are subscribing to cable, you can watch random hour-long excerpts of Dave's Gone By on Monday mornings at 1 a.m. and Tuesday mornings at 4 a.m. I'm hoping, like, when fall rolls around, we can maybe uh, sneak into a better time slot. But Monday's at 1, Tuesday's at 4 in the morning for one hour completely random excerpts of Dave's Gone By. Still, the best place to find us, davesgoneby.com, and, of course, this Facebook page, which automatically archives pretty much all our shows going back since we've been doing them on video. Uh, I think that'll tell you everything you need to know, except if you want to contact me, Dave's Gone By at AOL.com is the way to do it. And if you want to see my Twitter feed, it's Radio Dave 2. Radio Dave, the number 2. And of course, if you know people like Leslie, who don't have Facebook, who can't watch the show, tell them about the archives, tell them to come see the show, tell them to come watch my play, on video, live streaming video, Monday night, July 12th. I'll, I'll be putting that up <laughs> in every possible place and way that I can. So it's a few minutes after noon Eastern time on this Saturday morning. Um, Joyce, are you feeling uh, criminal? I want to post one of two on the aisle for Leslie. Oh, that's nice. Joyce is, Joyce is making sure to promote the guests on this show. Uh, by by showing how you can get to Connie's site. David, how do you do? Yeah. Uh, spell aisle, because how are they doing it? A I S L E. That's what I do, but then it comes up something different. Well, so it, it's not like twoontheisle.com. It's their YouTube page. That, that's the thing. Two on the Isle is a program that Leslie Hoban Blake hosted with our other friend Charlie Gross. Uh, for years and years, where they reviewed theater. I mean, you can go back and see review what how they reviewed Broadway shows that opened in 1997 at Two on the Isle, the YouTube page. Kind of cool. Anyway, it's so so we still have our Colorado Limerick of the Damned to do, but the other main thing we have to do today is go to Greeley, Colorado, because. <laughs> We lived there for a bunch of what years. What same show that was, David. Yes, I know. I know. <laughs> and we're not done yet because it's, it, we, we still have criminality and old-timeality to do in what we call Greeley Crimes and Old Times. And what this means, I think this is the first time I've used uh, no, iTunes today. Um, let, me, let me just find my, oh, that's there. i got to search for this next segment that we do every week because... Phone calls come in 
to the police department in northern Colorado. And then our friends at the uh, Greeley Tribune find items in the paper from 100 years ago. We mix them up for Greeley Crimes and Old Times. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ladies and gentlemen, Greeley crimes of all time. So what we do is it's it's straight from the Greeley Tribune newspaper. That's why I love it. I don't actually have to do any work on these. <laughs> I just I just pluck them. I reword them a little bit when I have to. But these are all true. These are all things that happened. Uh, either in Greeley, Colorado, over the past week or two, or things that were in the paper of Colorado all those years, ten decades ago. Are you ready, my darling? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Let's do it. Wait, wait, wait. Is that a caller? Is that a caller? Hello? Wait, Hello? Mm. Oh, it's a, it's a caller on 16th Street reporting a man getting out of his car to urinate on the caller's house. I mean, I get somebody driving around, not being able to find the bathroom, but why particularly, like... Yeah, that's, that's an omen. That's like a statement. When somebody wants to do that, that's like a... That yeah. Something. I don't yeah. know what it means, but it means... For me, it means I have a weak bladder. But for most other people, I think that's like a... Okay. Well, it could be a cab driver, like, eight hours no, in that's the not, They usually yeah. have... A, that's the term of non endearment now, speaking of strange drivers... Where'd the phone go? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because I've got the... Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. A caller on 43rd Avenue... Hello? ...reported that a driver just crashed into a mailbox. The mailbox seems to be okay. Oh, good. This is what they wrote in the paper. Good. Like, some driver went into a mailbox. Mailbox is fine. <laughs> Honest to gosh. By the way, a caller on First Street. Wait, there. Oh, oh, there he is. Those people on First Street are kind of delayed. Hey. Uh huh. <laughs> the caller reported a brown and tan collie mix <laughs> who is deaf and blind was loose and running into things. <laughs> Wow. Uh, what do you expect? Well, you would figure they have other senses. Dogs, they've got the noses. Yeah, he doesn't know where he's, why don't they just rescue him? Well, I, I, you know, not easy. How do they know he's deaf and blind? Well, because if your dog is bashing into no, something. Here, like, well, how do they know he's just not ignoring them? Oh, that could be. Hmm? That, that, it's like, yeah. Hmm. yeah. Talk to the you, you call it, like, dog. Figo, that's not my name. You talk, know. To the talk to the poor. <laughs> Let's do um, something old timey. These are, this is uh, an item that was in the Greeley Tribune Republican newspaper back in 1921. If you see an earnest looking young man speeding along in his flivver with several pigs inside, don't be alarmed. It's Charles Plum. <laughs> He's the leader of Well County's Boys and Girls Club. And he's delivering pigs to the members of the group who will raise them. Nice. Do you want to, that was, that's a pretty good job in 1921. Pig really deliverer. Good. Yeah. I like it. That's what, you know, that says a lot of potential. It's, it's Oinkber. It's, um, no, I got, I'm not going anywhere with that. Nope. Nowhere to go with it. Sorry. Let's try another one from 100 years ago. A letter to the editor complains of the many goats tied up on downtown street corners the writer, surprised that they, they put this in the paper, the writer said he had to wade through inch-deep goat manure to get through the area. That's terrible. Yeah. I'm surprised they weren't sheepish writing that. Anywho. Ha, 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 ha! Get it? Get it? A little, 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 little goat humor. Okay, at a moonshine trial. Oh, I love those moonshine trials. <laughs> The defendant's two moonshine stills were set up in the courtroom for study by the jury. But the judge complained it made his courtroom smell like whiskey. As opposed to the bottle that's, that's uh, hidden deep in his desk doing that too. 
Let's do another one. Let's do let's do some new time crime from Girly Crimes and Old Times. A so caller. Oh, oh who? thank you so much. Thank I you for the, the the nice comments, the thumbs up, the thank yous. Well, I don't know. Then they disappear. Then you see a thumbs up and then it, it goes away, or a heart, or uh, or an emoji vomiting when I say something, which we, we get to. Here we go. Okay. Here we go. A caller on 15th Street reported that the church across the street... Oh, let me get it. Let me get it. It's, it's international. It was a, it was a 10-digit number. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's actually international would be 11, right? Seven oh, because you have to do the, not, the yeah, one yeah. and the... Yeah, so I yeah. Know, maybe even longer, so... But this caller reported that the church across the street has the Bible on audiobook non-stop. Whoa. Caller said the noise makes it hard for them to sleep. Can you, how, who would, what church would just play on loudspeaker? I know. Wow. Wow. Can't even, wow. Anywho. Oh my God. Hun, this is, this is major. This is important. Get ready because we have a chicken alert. <laughs> All a chicken alert. <laughs> I love how we set these up and they mean nothing. It just means we have a story about a chicken. But this is not from a hundred years ago. You know, this is still Greeley, Colorado. There's chickens. So we have a chicken alert. A caller on Sitman Street reported their neighbor's chicken was attacked and ended up in the caller's yard. The caller doesn't want to tell the neighbor and have them see the headless dead chicken. Oh my god. Dead, oh, that's, that's just sad. How, how are you feeling? Oh. I know. Oh no. Oh. Yeah. And the chicken just said, cluck you. So, uh, yeah. Very, very sad. Very. How does he know that's the neighbor's chicken? Well, I, I don't know. I guess if your neighbor's yard is full of chickens, and suddenly one ends up dead and headless in your yard, there could be an educated guess. At least it's not like The Godfather, when you wake up with a, a headless chicken in your bed. Maybe it's a message. Because that, no, that would be foul. <laughs> ha! Ha! A caller on 37th Street reported seeing. Uh, wait. Oh, wait. Uh, hello? Hello? Hello, caller. Reported that. Um, seeing a Facebook post that read, quote, that's the last time you mess with my bird feeder, oh. along with a photo of a dead squirrel. The caller thinks the man who posted the message killed the squirrel, and, well, the guy wanted to know if anything could be done about oh, this. because he's saying that's the last time the squirrel messes with his bird feeder. That's I, scary. Yeah, man. Ooh. That's scary. Yeah, and why would you... Facebook post that to someone. Because he was happy that he killed the yeah. thing, but that's not that's not good. Yeah, yeah. I, he was, she was proud of his squirrel killing. I, I don't know how Bull, Bullwinkle felt about the whole thing. So, anywho, a caller on Twentieth Street reported that his wife took their dog outside. How would you react to that if you had a neighbor, and yeah. your wife took the dog outside? How, how would you react? I'd be like, hey, neighbor, how are yeah. you? Hey, neighbor, how are you? Unless the dog attacked and killed me well, or something enough. in my family. Well, no. This caller said he, his wife took their dog outside, and then the neighbor threatened to shoot the dog and then her. Why? I, it doesn't say why. That's one of the beautiful things about this. There's never a why. There's just, I see your poodle. I see your wife. <laughs> There's a decision involved because do I shoot the poodle first or the girl first? And and this guy went with the poodle. What's apparently. that expression from Bob Dylan? Bad blood got your mare. I guess that's a bad. <laughs> that's that's bad neighbor. They need to go on Judge Judy and work that out. They need some therapy. That's bad. <laughs> a caller. Uh oh. Here's a caller. On Twentieth Street, reported that his. Oh no, that I just that one. I'm sorry, caller called to ask if there was anywhere she could take a paralyzed squirrel she found in her backyard. 
Now, the woman did not want an officer to come get the squirrel because she didn't want it to get euthanized. Um, I don't know, maybe she can get a really small wheelchair from Mattel. Maybe that's the squirrel that the guy's trying to <laughs> <It's> kill. Like, <laughs> the, the poor squirrels are like, the guy's killing all of us. He's like, that's it. He's coming after us. He's coming after us one by one. It's that bird feeder. Don't do it. It's only bird seed. <laughs> hey, Save let's yourself. go. Let's go elsewhere for a moment. Let's, one of the things that we do during Greeley Crimes at all times is that um, we step away from Greeley in northern Colorado for one item that is from somewhere else. It's elsewhere, but it is still quite ridiculous in the news, and we share that with you. For example, Dateline, Connecticut. A Connecticut man was killed Saturday when his Harley-Davidson plowed into a bear. Oh, my God. In Connecticut. Uh, uh, Thomas Kavalik. Did a, not see the bear? I, I guess not. He, well, he was barely there. Uh, Thomas Kavalik, age 65, was thrown from his motorcycle and landed in the roadway after hitting a bear on Route 222 in Harwinton. State troopers found Kavalik lying in the roadway after the crash, which happened at about 10.30 at night, and he was pronounced dead at Charlotte Hungerford Hospital. In Hungerford Hospital, hurricanes hardly ever happen, except in Amherst. Anywho, I, I didn't know there were bears in Connecticut. In the gay community, sure, but, but... That's weird. I mean, how do you not see a bear? Well, there are no Nazi bears. It's no, not like in not Germany. Um, I don't know. Well, no. It, it, night, what time was it? It didn't say what time. Um, but they're big and they're growling. Like usually they're. You know, was ten thirty at night. A dark object just bumps into the deer? roadway, crosses the road. You know, and then I, there are deer crossing signs. What do they I think assume it was. They could buy a crane. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I just don't know. Mm. Honestly, anywho, that's an unbearable story, my friends. Let's let's close out with a couple more to um, um, our grilly crimes and old times on this Saturday. Early afternoon, a caller, oh my, on 12th Avenue reported a party of about 100 people behind his house where party, <laughs> what a party, party goers were puking in the alleyway and broke his fence. Oh my God. That's a, that's a shindig, ladies and gentlemen. That's, that's where was it? better than my wine and cheese things, 12th it? Avenue. Um, oh, I think I know. There's yeah. one block right near the school where they do bad stuff. Oh, I imagine. The caller said he was getting nervous about the behavior of the party. No kidding. If people, I mean, the puking is one thing, but breaking a fence while puking? I mean, yeah. Yeah. maybe the bear was there. I just, you know, sometimes these teenagers, they just need to throw up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I, I don't know where that... That went nowhere. Yeah, okay. He meant grow up, but you were making a joke. Yes. I get it. That's yeah. funny. Yeah. They should, they, really, they should just go to the local pub. That way they could be barf lies. <laughs> oh, yes. The Technicolor yawn, my friend. Okay, here's another. Uh, a caller on 30th Street. Oop. Let me get the phone. They're calling. Hello. A caller on 30th Street said the little boy who, lived, who lives upstairs knocked on her door and left a Tupperware covered in foil and filled with white stuff. She called police. Is it but rice pudding? She didn't know what the white stuff was. White stuff? Yeah. So now it's to be... Rice pudding. Sugar. Oh, can I borrow a cup of sugar from you? 200 years, neighbors have been, you know, yes, can I like borrow and yes, return yes. sugar? And But this woman thinks, huh. I wonder if it's pure cocaine from Colombia. It's like <laughs> a child is delivering a Tupperware container. It's got, and she calls the cops. Oh, what kind of world? That's a waste of, uh, that's an inappropriate use of, like. I know. Just call, um, I'd say, like, who, this is what we used to say back on the block. Who's your mom? They'd say, who's your mom and dad? And then you call the mom and dad. Uh, and they, they work it out, you know? No, now granted, you never know. Sometimes a kid comes down, the parents don't even know it, and they're Pablo Escobar, no, and the kid no. like takes a baggie. Trust me, no kid is gonna bring cocaine. I guess not. A caller uh, near Tenth Street. Oh, oh, hello, hello, don't go away. Oh, there you are. Um, 
I like to do the show. Uh, call us. No Jane do it. <laughs> Near 10th Street. <laughs> reported um, a young woman carrying a knife around and stabbing lawns. I mean, there are ways to aerate the soil, but I don't know. Sometimes gardening is frustrating. Yes. It's very yeah. frustrating. Maybe she was planting seeds. Yeah, I just think the Gridley Tribune should have dug deeper and gotten the dirt on her. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> oh, I just soiled myself. <laughs> little, little dirt joke. Yeah. Okay, well, let's close up really class in all times. Yeah, smoking. Yeah. Here's what, well, the, perfect timing for this one. A drunk caller on M Street. Oh, I can smell, can smell it on his breath on here. The caller reported he was being followed and harassed by people on the way to a graveyard. He said he had a shotgun and was trying to get sober. Is there a combination more yeah. suited to Greeley than a drunk person on the way to the graveyard holding a shotgun and trying to get sober? While thinking someone followed them. I bet yeah. you he's the one who shot the squirrel. I wonder. I have a feeling he might have been a little, you know. Might have been. Might have been. Ladies and gentlemen. It's hard to say. That is Greeley Crimes and Old Times for this Saturday, June 26th, 2021. Mr. Horace Greeley was no fool. I'm sure that you'll agree with me that Greeley was no fool. But he is getting a new set. Mr. Greeley was no fool. Yippee-yi, yippee-yi, yippee-yi-yi-yi-yi. Yippee-yi, yippee-yi, yippee-yi. Thank you, thank you, Groucho. Well, it is almost, not quite, almost 12.30 in the afternoon. Here we are live in the neighborhood on this Saturday, June 26, 2021. I'm Dave Lefkowitz here with my darling, wonderful, and adorable wife. We've got a few more minutes to finish up this 804th episode of Dave's Gone By. First of all, we are immensely grateful. First of all, I'm very grateful to uh, Nathan over at the Red Bull Theater Company for putting me in touch with Connie Kong. Oh, is somebody calling me? I know. I know. Nope. Mm. Hang up. Mm. Anywho, <laughs> so uh, they, uh, for putting me in touch with Connie Congdon, who I thought, oh, she would be really great to have on the show, and she was. So everybody, 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 go check her out. Google her. Uh, a couple of her scripts are actually, you can read them online, plus... Watch her play, her one-act play, which is coming up on July 12th uh, from the Red Bull Theater Company. It's a, a virtual benefit for the company, the Short New Play Festival. Tickets range from zero, pay what you can, all the way up as much as you want to pay. But it's July 12th, Monday night, 7.30 in the evening. My play will be part of that festival, too. But thank you very, very much for Connie Congdon for being this new friend of the neighborhood. Friends of the neighborhood are people who appear as guests on this show. So we also have to thank, as ever, Leslie Hoban Blake for joining us. Remember to um, check her out. That's true. And David Sheward um, of the David Desk blog and also theaterlife.com, culturaldaily.com. David Sheward regaining I want to read his the crown. Yeah, that, that looks I like think fun. Many of those, set, those shows needed therapy. Oh well, yeah. yeah in retrospect, no, but Tabitha's not in it. That's I'm a little offended by that. The child. Yeah. Tabitha. The child. Yeah. Well, she'd be grown up by now. Yeah, but she had witching powers. Like she wiggled her nose like her mother. Why isn't Tabitha? Remember the yeah. what was the guy who was the company owner? Remember he was like Darren's boss. Was that Roger C. Carmel? The but he, actor, yeah, he was so funny. He was yeah. If I'm remembering this, he should be in there too because he caused a lot of conflict by keeping Darren at work. I know. I think they uh, were in a relationship just myself. It could be. He was he was swallowing the the, the protein stuff. I think if I don't even want to go there, but. Speaking of friends of the neighborhood, people who've been on this program, we like to keep tabs on them. We like to know what they're up to in terms of, hey, 
They were on the program 5, 10, 15 years ago. They're still active. They're still writing plays. They're still appearing in plays and movies and TV shows. They're writing books and so forth. What are the Friends of the Neighborhood up to? Well, first of all, got to give a shout out to actress and writer Tonya Pinkins and director. Uh, she is at the Westport Country Playhouse, but I didn't write down in what or doing what. I think she's doing a benefit. It's tonight. Uh, Tonya Pinkins, just go to the Westport Country Playhouse and look that up. want to remind you that just uh, ending this weekend, today and tomorrow, your last chances to catch the great Andre the Shields playing King Lear at the Forest Park Shakespeare Festival in St. Louis, if you happen, happen to be out that way. Also, hey, Toba Felchu is starring in the solo show Becoming Dr. Ruth. That is at the Bay Street Theater out on Sag Harbor, Long Island. I want to remind you that it's both a live event, but also they're streaming some of the things, too. So it's, it's a whole hybrid mixture of it. It's Toba Felchu as Dr. Ruth Westheimer, at the Bay Street Theater, but it's ending tomorrow, so you have two more chances to catch it. I uh, want to let you know, speaking of things that are playing just through this weekend, the, um, the musical bio Love Linda, featuring our friend Stevie Holland, that is streaming via Broadway On Demand, and it's all about Cole Porter's wife, Linda, with Stevie Holland playing her. Rain Pryor, Richard Pryor's daughter, she is a friend of the neighborhood. She's a comedian, an actress, and writer, and, and now a director. She is directing a play called Golden Wings for Theater Resources Un Theater Resources Unlimited. I'm actually a member. I should know the name of it. It's tomorrow only. It's a reading, Golden Wings, directed by Rain Pryor. For more information, go to TRU, Theater Resources Unlimited. I uh, want to let you know that there's going to be a Zoom show from Monday through July 11th of two plays, Something Unspoken and The Hairdresser, featuring our friend Penny Fuller. And then after that play, there's going to be a Q&A with our radio friend Valerie Smaldone and our recent actress friend Louise Lasser. For more information, go to foodforthoughtproductions.com. Foodforthoughtproductions.com. And, oh my gosh, on June 30th, this week, I think it's Wednesday, only a couple of days away, Woody King Jr., the director, the founder of New Federal Theater, is stepping down after decades uh, as the head of that theater company. You know, and when they would send out press releases, it wasn't just New Federal Theater with Woody King Jr. as the artistic director founder. It was literally called Woody King Jr.'s New Federal Theater. Well, he was a great guest a couple of months ago. We wish him all the best of success in his life going forward. But he's leaving the New Federal Theater on Wednesday. And then, um, playing now through July 4th, uh, a revival of It's Only a Play, the Terrence McNally comedy. It's a virtual thing. It's watchable on Zoom from New Jersey's George Street Playhouse, featuring our very funny friend, Julie Holston. Reminding you that Evan Seplo is the founder and editor of Stage Buddy. Dot com. You can watch Dr. Demento shows at Dr. Or excuse me, listen to. He's still he's still a radio guy. Dr. Demento dot com. Gilbert Gottfried does his amazing colossal podcast where he interviews a bunch of people. Uh, David Kenny still doing his radio show. Everything old is new again. Sunday nights on WBAI radio. And Bob Cudmore doing podcasts of upstate New York history at bobcudmore.com. Those, my friends, are the friends of the neighborhood. Thank you, Wolfgang. Yes, we have one more <laughs> bit of business to do in this 804th episode of the Dave's Gone By show. We've had, oh my God, haven't we had so much fun? We've gone to... Uh, Really, crimes and old times. I've, I've ranted about my very, very special scrotal ointment. <laughs> there it is. Uh, you didn't want to miss all that, I know. We talked about 
you know, going to a farmer's market. We had our Today Yesterday quiz with wonderful guests, David Sheward, Connie Congdon, and Leslie Hope and Blake. Connie oh, Congdon, we had a delightful... What a great group in the quiz. Oh. It was very clean. Oh, oh you okay. And Connie Congdon, a very uh, de <laughs> delightful... Theater de no, she... Joyce spilled her water, but nothing yeah. spilled. Wow. Um, it's going to be a good day. So, and, and Connie Congdon, a very, very delightful guest to talk to about theater and, and so honest and fun. And, and it makes you want to read her plays. Yeah, there I'm really are. To see. I'm, I'm yeah. looking forward to the festival, but of course your play is not going to be my favorite. It better, it better be. Wanna, I'm really looking forward to seeing all the other work. Because Connie, Connie's kind of going in some, a similar direction. Her play involves a landlord um, evicting a theater, and they're, they're moving things over. Uh -oh. Yeah. Uh-oh, 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 wait a second. And I'm guessing hers is a rhyme verse also. Uh-oh. So I don't know. The wait, battle wait, of the playwrights. Hold on, wait, wait, wait. wait. Oh, oh, Joyce is scrolling through comments. Wait, Thank you for your... I'm going to look in the new play festival. Oh, are I'm there... I want to see if they give the blurb. I have the short play festival. Oh, yeah, 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 let's hear it. Uh, the name of the play, by the uh, way. Wait, hold on. Hers is called Deep in the Deep in a Night of 1599 on the Banks of, of the Tam, 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 Thames. Yeah. Thames. Players from one theater called the Theater uh, dissemble to escape abusive rent payments. They wait for barges to carry their lumber across the river where they will build another theater yet to be named. She's ripping off Agamemnon. Oh. That's the, the thing of like where the ships won't sail, and this is a very common Greek theme. It's not, yeah. She's not ripping off. No, I, not ripping she's off. having a play, I mean, and this is a true story. They, they had to build, tear down the theater, and rebuild it across the water. I'm and the guessing. person named the play, remember, one wasn't named. Now it's uh, if this not be a good play, then the devil is in it. That's which, Connie's the play. The one is called Echo, which is a. a, a uh, what? Of a what? Greek play. Okay. The wolf tree is uh, a revolutionary leader and shepherdess beneath the tree. Yeah. Restoration Playhouse is artistic director and stage manager of a tiny New York theater face obstacles post pandemic. And oh, then that play sucks. Restoration yeah. Restoration Jewel, a modern day short play written by um, oh a character in play in, in a um, a play called the uh, the Lion and the Jewel. Okay. The misan misanthrope breaks his quarantine, and that's uh, COVID is over in twenty twenty three. Everyone's moved on except one person. Oh, that's funny. Who yeah, wrote that? Uh, that's a Charles Ron Lee. Ran, Ron Lee. I can't con oh. like Ron Lee. Oh. And then Lunar on a, a, a cool summer night, teenage friends get together to watch a, a total lunar eclipse. Very different. Oh, and, oh I, I think I'm going to enjoy. It's going to be really good. Monday night. July 12th, so it's not this Monday night, and it's not next Monday night, but it's, it's two and a half weeks away, of the um, the Red Bull Theater Company Short New Play Festival. Everybody, go Google it. Go buy your tickets or, or get your free tickets. You know, you, you can watch it for free. But if you want to support the theater, throw them $5 or something if you want, or 25 and up for, for picking Old Dave's play. You know, this is what keeps writers going. Well, I'm not making, uh, you know, a million... Uh, Connie Condon didn't end up writing for the movies and making half a million dollars for a screenplay. She, like so many of us, run to the reaches of academia, so we have a, a steady paying job with benefits and then write plays because we want to, you know? So what keeps a playwright wanting to if they don't even have a steady the job in academia? And a sense of desperation. The glittering prize, the sense of desperation and the glittering prizes. The, the feeling that somebody recognized, aha, I this is talented. From the audience, no? Well, that you you first have to get produced to get a validation from an audience. If you can't get your play even up, mm. you sit there, you spend months writing it, hours and hours thinking about it, revising it, trying to find inspiration because it's ninety seven percent you know, perspiration, and then it sits there, you send it out, and nobody wants it, and you know it's good, or you hope it's good, but you never even get the shot to discover whether it's good or not. And then every once in a blue moon, you send it out, and it's like, oh, somebody else, at least one or two other people, thought, hey, this is quality stuff and it can play. Let's get this going. And so I, I thank eternally the Red Bull Theater Company for that, you know, for, for making me double back on a, the play I wrote 25 years ago that I thought I finished and didn't, and now I'm working on it again, which I may or may not finish. What was that? How could you lose a play? 
I didn't, well, no, I didn't, I just, I thought I finished it. And then I must have let it, I think I, I slogged to get to the end of act one and it was already like 70 something pages. I must've looked at it and, and forgot about it, but now I've remembered it and I'm reworking on it. Why? Because every once in a while I get this thing of like winning best script for the miracle of long johns at the fringe festival or having my one act play done by a pretty major outfit called the red bull company so yeah is it going to change my life <laughs> no uh is it going to make me happy for a night probably and is it going to keep me writing for a while yeah anyway it is 20 to 1 eastern time here in the neighborhood we're finishing up finishing up the 804th episode of Dave's Gone By, except, oh my God, I almost forgot myself. All these things we did today, all the fun we had, yeah. and speaking even of poetry, I have not yet done the Colorado limerick of the dam. Oh, I was hoping that was like over. <laughs> no, I'm no, I'm afraid not. We we generally save that to the end because we want people to stay tuned for the whole thing and then and then turn off the computers now. So oh, how, how did that happen? We have what I've been doing for a while now is writing a short poem about all these different places in Colorado. Everyone I could find on the map or or, or in a list. A big city, small towns. Did you make up some of them? No. no, these are all legitimate, actual things. Some of them barely have like 20 people. They're ghost towns, but they have an old post office or some kind of general store. These are actual places in Colorado. I've been doing dozens and dozens of them, one a week, and we do have a brand new Colorado Limerick of the Damned where we're going to Montezuma, Colorado. A limerick is a comic verse of five lines, in which lines one, two, and five will end with words that rhyme. And likewise, verses three and four also end with words that rhyme. So, this is a limerick. Up the mountain, Colorado. Colorado limerick of the damned for Montezuma. So, let me tell you a little bit about this tiny town in northern central Colorado. It was named, of course, for the emperor of the Aztecs, former silver mining camp near the mountains and over by Snake River. Sounds like fun. Uh, back just right about now, they have about 65 people living there. But it, so it's a ghost town, but they really are living there. It is a functional community. In fact, between 2004 and 2009, a resident at Montezuma, Colorado ran a lo-fi radio station. I'm so jealous. I would love that. It's also known for trails and backcountry skiing it's incredibly scenic like so many places in colorado are however it has also been known for a bunch of devastating fires and a contested local election in which the town sued all the voters in the town and forced them to appear in court to figure out who won what so it was, it was so contested that they literally had to get every person in the town who voted up to swear who they vote for that's Colorado for you too so Montezuma Colorado I decided to write a poem about Montezuma you can keep the kids in in the room for this one it's gross but it's not dirty well dirty in a different way but anyway ahem, ahem. a pretty young actress named Uma would go out to eat and consume a shit ton of chicken until she would sicken and suffer revenge Montezuma. That's the one. That's the one. Please send your comments and complaints to Dave's Gone By at AOL.com. Dave's Gone By at AOL.com. Also, check my Twitter feed, Radio Dave 2. Also, of course, you can post on my Facebook page, or if you're a Facebook friend, you can message me directly. The Facebook page, tell everyone. Dave's Gone By. The archive website, davesgoneby.com. The, um, what else? The archives also at archive.org. The audio archives at castbox.fm. 
also some archives posted on YouTube, and yeah, yeah, that's there's tons of ways to keep track of what's going on with the program, whom we'll be having on in the weeks ahead. I've got nobody to to mention yet, nobody to promise for next week. So you're just gonna have to check our website, davesgoneby.com, and this Facebook page, and and you can see for yourself, or just be surprised. Just tune in next Saturday. It will be the first Saturday in July for the 805th episode of Dave's Gone By. Remains for me to thank so, so much David Sheward, Leslie Hoban Blake, Connie Congdon for being such fun guests in the neighborhood. Thank you to my wonderful, adorable, and amazing wife, Joyce. Love you, sweetie. Want, want to send out a happy birthday upcoming to my mom, who turns, I'm not going to say what, uh, actually, off the top of my head, I don't know what age this week, but anniversary of the too. happy birthday to my mom, and with loving, fond memory of our dachshund, Ufti Guft's passing about, well, a year ago this week. So bittersweet time in the neighborhood, as it kind of always is, but, but, through it all, I have my scrotum cream. Mmm, mmm, good. And gone by. He's gone by. He's gone by.